I like to start with reciting Surah Al-Fatiha as Allah teaches us to ask for guidance and I'm very sure today we're all here to hear something from the Book of Allah from the teachings of His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, something that could touch your heart and change your life and make you hit on a journey of transformation inshaAllah we don't learn knowledge for entertainment we don't learn knowledge for amusement we don't learn knowledge for just knowing and uh, we actually learn so that we can change become better people every day your goal should be to become a better person If today you didn't learn something new and you did not apply something new and you did not do something, I mean here by new, good, then today is worse than yesterday. If today you learned something new and applied it, then today is better than yesterday. And it's very important that every day you live is better than the day before. That's a good life to live. That's an energetic life. That's an amazing life to be always looking for transformation and change. SubhanAllah, Allah shows us signs in His creation that something like a worm that to us is unpleasant, to our eyes, kind of disgusting, you know. Um, but this worm, you know, crawls, eat leaves, uh, becomes fatter and fatter and fatter until it really looks unpleasant. And then suddenly this worm uh, goes into a process of fasting. It builds a grave for itself. This grave is under a leaf, not under the ground. It builds a cocoon and it dies. But it's not dying, it's going through a transformation. Who in the world would think something that can only crawl, cannot even run, will end up flying? It's just mind-boggling, profoundly uh, you know, deep. This worm, the caterpillar, would look and uh, it's crawling, it can't even run, forget flying. I mean, imagine yourself flying. You know, we can barely walk and sometimes run, and when we run, we can't run for a long time. And then suddenly you see yourself flying. We can only see that in dreams. In dunya, if you eat the right food, you do the right thing, and once you die, you transform to something that can fly, can go places, and you will not believe what you could become. You will not believe what you can become, but if you believe it and you chase it, you will be it, inshallah, as I will share with you how that is actually true. And I'm not even being metaphoric. <laughs> I'm actually being actual. <coughs> the human, when we hit puberty and we wake up and we look at ourselves, we evaluate ourselves based on our body. Our body is made of dirt and water. Science tells us that today. Islam told us that a long time ago. So, in this life, you can live thinking you are one thing and one dimension, or you can live feeling, touching, realizing, discovering the truth about yourself that you are not only dirt and water, you're not only a body. We live our lives chasing this body. And this body is made of dirt and water, and it acts like dirt and water. 
dirt doesn't smell good. If you leave it in a box, in a bottle, it even rots. It starts growing some fungi. And that doesn't smell good. And when you leave your body for 24 hours, it doesn't smell good. You have to take a shower. And still when you take a shower, it still there is a smell. So you end up using soap and shampoo. And still it wouldn't work. So you go behind and apply lotion that has a scent. And still that doesn't work, so you turn around and you start applying perfumes and scents and colognes and other oils because you're trying to cover the smell of dirt. <laughs> and what happens, um, we live our lives chasing. So this is dirt, what am I going to feed it? I'm going to feed it dirt. So, fruits and vegetables are plants that grew from dirt and meat. They are animals that ate vegetation that was made from dirt. So, animals are also dirt. You like a house that is made of dirt and water, dirt and wood. Wood grew up from dirt. And because you like dirt so much, the bigger the house, the more dirt it is, the more you like it. You like a car, and your car that you drive is also made of dirt. They used to ride horses, now we drive cars. And cars are very unattractive when they are in the raw. So the final thing for you to buy it is painting. So they have to paint the car with yellow and call it Ferrari, or white and blue and call it Lamborghini, or dark green and call it Maserati. And that's how we live our lives. If we just remove the veil a little bit, take five minutes of reflection, we're eating dirt, we're wearing dirt, we live in dirt, we drive dirt. And then we, when we want to earn some, when we want to beautify ourselves, we beautify ourselves with dirt. So we go and find some dirt that is shiny and yellow, gold, which we find it under dirt. We don't find gold in the clouds, we find it right under our feet, mixed with dirt. And then we put dirt on dirt. Now it looks good. <laughs> and then sometimes we become jealous of roosters and peacocks. So we go and get some yellow dirt, blue dirt, red dirt, and put it on our face so that we can start looking like maybe a rooster or something. <laughs> and now, because dirt makes us look beautiful, and you become so happy because you look good with the gold that's from dirt, with makeup from dirt, with maybe nice haircut or beard cut, which is also dirt. And we live our lives like that, and we become so much into that, that we, for that dirt, we will lie. For that dirt, we will cheat. For that dirt, we will steal. For that dirt, we're actually willing to kill and destroy, so that we can make sure who has more dirt than the other one. And that's why people who live that life, we call them dirty people, because they're always chasing dirt. So, subhanAllah, this cycle works when you are 20, 30, 40, but as you gain older, you start discovering that I'm not excited about dirt anymore. I want something more. And because you are something more, because you have an element about you that is not dirt, as a matter of fact, it's not from this world altogether, which is your soul that breathes in you, your mind and your heart, then that, you know, you start discovering yourself. And because if you keep on chasing dirt, 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 you become depressed. Imagine someone who graduates with a PhD in law from UC Berkeley and then comes back and applies for a doctorate degree from UC Berkeley, applies for a job. I want to teach at your law school. And they say, okay, you want a job? Yes, I want a job. Here's a contract. 
Whoa, alhamdulillah, he signs, he shows up next day to work wearing his suit, and they hand him over a bucket and a mop. And they say, excuse me, what is this? Your job. Excuse me? Yeah, your job. I'm a PhD in law. I came here to teach. It's not our problem that you didn't read the contract. You, you, you signed a contract. We wanted a janitor. Do you want the job or not? We have other people applying. Imagine if you are under so much pressure that you have to accept the job. And then I see you in one of the halls of Berkeley mobbing the floor. What will be your state? Sadness, depression feeling down, disappointment, shock, embarrassment. And this is exactly the state of human beings who live their lives thinking that they are only dirt when they are actually qualified for way much more than dirt. Way much more. But we fail to see that. There's something about us that is out of this world, literally out of this world. It has to be out of this world. SubhanAllah. So when you look at that, Brothers and sisters, Islam comes and remove that veil so we can see things for what they are, not what they appear to be. So we can start looking at things and say, oh, this is dirt. Okay, I get it. I'm made from water and dirt. Um, so I have to use dirt. I get it. But there's something about me that is more. I'm not going to spend my life just chasing this. I'm qualified for more. I'm so much qualified for more that Allah made angels bow down to me. When I was in my father's back, Adam salam, angels bowed down to Adam and Adam represented humanity, all of his children. <sighs> People live their life wishing that they are angels and angels actually made sujood. I mean, do you know how big is that? In Islam, which is the final message, so people don't get confused, Allah forbids sujood to anyone other than Allah. In the religions before us, Allah allowed sujood of respect. That's why Yusuf salam, his father, his mother, and his brothers all fell into sujood. They didn't worship him, they are prophets, but they did sujood of respect. In our religion, Allah forbid it uh, for us because, you know, because it opens doors for the ignorant. They start worshipping whatever people make sujood to. So our Prophet them said, stop doing that. Don't do that. Not for me, not for anyone else. He didn't want to even people bow down to him. So, what's in you that would make an angel bow down to you. Inshallah, I will be able to come back one day and teach a course, seminar, longer than this one, about angels. Um, but angels are serving us. One writes your right deed, one writes your bad deeds, one carries your du'a, one brings the du'a back, one protects you. One is here to inspire you with good ideas and good thoughts. Angels are working around you, for you. Yeah, it's just sometimes mind-boggling. Allah honors you, brings you angels. You're surrounded by angels. It's an image that we only think of holy people. When actually that holy person is you, if you choose to be. Someone is sitting down and surrounded by angels. One is on his right, one on his left. One is behind him, one is in front of him. One is in talking to him. Do good, do good. It's an image of someone very special. And that someone who's very special is no one else but you. You don't have to be anything else. You don't have to be a sheikh, imam, wali, this. It's given to every human being. But some human decides to not listen to one, two, three, four, five angels and listen to one shaitan. <laughs> very interesting. People say, oh, I don't know what to do with my shaitan, I'm very weak, I'm this. Allah gave you five angels for one shaitan, and you're complaining? Come on, man, get up. Wake up. Make a choice. So if you imagine yourself sitting down, and you don't have to be anything special, you're already special. 
Allah in the Quran, not me, Allah in the Quran says, I've created the skies and the earth for you. Not the sky, the skies, samawat. People translate it to heavens and people get confused between heaven, heaven, sky, or heaven, jannah. Forget the word heaven, just sky. <coughs> in Surah Luqman, Allah says, can't you see that I have subdued, subjected, subjected to you that which is in the sky and that which is on earth? Can't I are you not, are you blind? From the rain in the sky, to you flying, to now going space station, to landing a rover on Mars, to stepping on the moon, can't you see? <coughs> that I have subdued, subjected to you that which is in the skies, that which is on earth. Surah Al-Baqarah, third page, if you open in the bottom. Allah says, it is he who created for you everything that exists on earth. Everything that exists on earth. That's not me. That's not hadith. That's Allah's word. And Allah gives me so much honor. And you say, oh, I'm miskeen, I have no honor, I'm very weak. Shh. Shh. Who's, what are you talking? You're just repeating the words of shaitan. You're repeating, you just want a break, you just want to be lazy. You just want to do nothing. Allah creates for you skies and earth. Before you come to planet earth, God knows they are saying 14 billion years in the make. The last five seconds you show skies. Allah says, I decorated for you the sky for you. The skies with lanterns. And I made a protection for you. I made the rain fall upon you so that it will grow vegetations and you will drink and eat and your animals will eat. And it's all for you, for you, for you. How much more honor can Allah or would Allah give you for you to wake up? Created the skies for you, the earth for you, angels are serving you, prophets are coming to guide you, books are sent to enlighten you, and you are trying to pretend that you are nobody. I'm sorry, you can pretend all that you want, it's not going to fly. It's not going to fly. I'm telling you, on the Day of Judgment, it will not fly. You can pretend you are a miskeen all day long and miskeena all day long. You're not a miskeen, you're not a miskeena. You are the richest of Allah's creation. Only if you are, God knows. Allah said, I have honored the children of Adam. People want honor, position, special, different. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. That's Allah's word. We have honored the children of Adam. We carried them in the land and in the sea. And I preferred them over a great portion of my creation. Allah says, I preferred you over a great portion of my creation. Now I'm, I'm just I'm asking, you're going to believe Allah or believe yourself? You're going to believe Allah or shaitan? You're going to believe Allah or your lazy nafs? Allah says, I have honored you. And you say, no, I'm not honored. <laughs> I don't get it. And that's why we have to embrace that honor. Embrace that honor. Allah Azza wa Jal, in his knowledge and his will, of what he told us, I already had angels. And the angels already were worshipping me in endless numbers. The Prophet ﷺ in Isra al Mi'raj he said, I visited Al Bayt al Mahmur, the Kaaba of Malaika on the seventh sky. I saw 70,000 angels make Hajj to that house every day. They never ever come back again. How many 70,000 angels did Allah create? Allah knows. So, Who makes it on the Day of Judgment? The one who embraced that honor. The one who accepted it. The one who capitalized on it. The one who took it and ran with it in the right direction. That's who makes it on the Day of Judgment. But so long you're going to say, Oh, I'm not a prophet. Oh, I'm not a messiah. Oh, I'm not an imam. Oh, I'm not a sheikh. All of these, by the way, imam, sheikh, maulana, whatever that is, alim, whatever that is. This all came after the generation of the Sahaba. Allah called ulama, ulama, uli the people of ilm, 
But these titles that people make in your head big, uh, it's not going to help on the Day of Judgment. It will probably ruin the person who receives them more than help him. Right? You start thinking so high of yourself, you like you become full of yourself. May Allah prevent us from falling into that. So the idea is here. You really don't have to be anybody other than yourself. You are already honored. You're already special. You're already different. People today, to be, to look different and special, they won't have tattoo. Body piercing. Right. Your thumb is different. Your face and features are different. No two human beings have the same distance between here and here, here and here, here and here. It's mind body. That your eye print is different. Right now, your Samsung phone, your iPhone takes, you look at it. The whole world can look at your phone, it won't unlock. You're really different. You're really special. What more do you want? So, if you decide to embrace that honor, you make a choice. What's different about me and you is that we are one of two creations that we are aware of that worship Allah based on choice. You know, in human relationships, mom and dad have to live, have to love their children. They have to love their children. Do you know why marriage is different? It's the only relationship you choose. It's the only relationship you choose who to love. I mean, you you gotta love your brother and sister, even if you hate them. <laughs> you have to love your mom and dad. Your mom and dad have to love you. Do you have to love your spouse? No. It's a choice. That's why it's different. And we initiate, we initiate that in the name of Allah. We say, in the name of Allah, you two shall be married. We initiate that relationship in the name of Allah. Because it's very different and special. You are we and the jinn. And since we are not jinn, we're going to leave the jinn alone. Let the jinn talk about the jinn. <laughs> we're going to be talking about us, human beings. Unless we have any jinn with us, we'll come to the class. <laughs> but the idea is, when we are looking at us, human beings, the jinn will be for us. We came after the jinn. When Iblis saw how much honor Allah gave Adam, he flipped out. He's like, what is this? You say you created the heavens and the earth for him, not for me? Allah said, yes. You make the angels bow down for this? Why not for me? I've been here longer. I've been here before. I've been doing more. Who is this? He just showed up on the block. Allah said, do you know or do I know? <coughs> ya Allah, you created me from fire. You created him from clay. I mean, come on. Do you know Shaitan knows your honor, how much you're honorable, more than you know how much you're honorable? Because that's what flipped him out. He became so full of jealousy, he couldn't. Allah gave him a chance to repent. Allah told him, why? Why didn't you make sujood? So Allah gave him a chance to repent. Allah is fair. He saw so much honor in you, he couldn't handle it. His heart bursted. His iman got out of the window. Allah told him, okay, I give you a chance. Why didn't you obey my command? Go ahead, you can repent. No, I'm not repenting. I'm not making sujood to him. I don't care. You created me from fire. You created him from clay. I'm better than him. If you know that Allah created you from fire, and you know that Allah created, so Allah knows who, what He created, right? And He still says, make sujood. So make sujood. <coughs> Iblis saw our potential, saw your potential, saw your, saw your, your, your value, <laughs> and it destroyed him from inside. He lost it, completely lost it. Do you know, most of people in Mecca, especially the leaders of Mecca, they could not handle it inside them that Allah chose Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa Yatim, grew up poor. His mom, dad died first, then his mom died second, then his grandfather died. And then they said, Allah said in the Quran, and they said, 
had this Quran been revealed to one of the two great men of the two villages. One of the great men of the two villages. <coughs> the village of Mecca, yani the city of Mecca and the city of Taif. So they couldn't handle it. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira told him, this is beautiful, let's believe. They said, are you okay? Abu Jahl told him, by Allah, if you, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, become Muslim today, tomorrow all of Mecca will become Muslim. You're like, wow, that's great, let me do it. No, How what he told him, he told him, and then the Arabs will say, it was Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira who changed the religion of his fathers and the religion of his people. People will not believe because of Muhammad. People will believe because of you. Are you willing to go down that path of dishonor in the books of history? And I was like, oh wow, maybe it's me, not Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why the first sin and the most destructive sin from inside is jealousy. Why her, not me? Why him? Why? Allah gave her a gift and gave you a million gifts. Gave you a gift too. Every one of us is special. You better believe that. I believe that. It will kill your ego if you believe that. I'm telling you. If you believe everyone is special, it will kill your ego. I swear. Because what a worry. You think I have what you don't have. They have what you don't have. End of the story. Shaitan will never be able to enter you, enter to you from that path. Khalas, everyone is special. I'm not competing with who's better. I'm competing who's with who's more honorable in the eyes of Allah. And Allah said, the most honorable of you in my sight is the most righteous. So I want to be the most righteous. Who knows who's the most righteous from not the most righteous? Allah. And where is righteousness? Inside, it shows in your words and actions. I'm not here to impress people. I'm not here to show off to people. I'm here to impress and show off to Allah. Do you know what we call show off to Allah? Ikhlas, sincerity. <laughs> when you wake up at night and you say, Ya Allah, I don't want anyone to see me. I just want you to see me. I want to impress you and no one else. Allah encouraged you that in you. That show off to Allah, not to people, we call it sincerity. That's when show off becomes sincerity. And when a person walks into the masjid, and the message is full of people and start praying slowly, that sincerity, we call it show off. That's why, brothers and sisters, you know, subhanAllah, our story starts with honor. First stage of seven stages that we go through is the world of dots of light, nasamat, souls, in the back of Adam from the beginning of the creation, the first stage. We witnessed when the angels bowed down to our father, we were in his back, in his leon, or lion, or eagle. Loin, in his loin. His back. Do we remember? No, we don't. But it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Then we move from Alam al-Nasamat to Alam al-Arwah, the world of souls. And Allah says, before you come to this world, Allah says, before you come to this world, when your mom and dad meet, <coughs> the, and, and they, they meet and they get their aqid nikah, immediately Allah takes from their backs, from their loins, their descendant. This is an ayah in the Quran. Dhurriyatahum, I would like to Dhurriyatahum, <coughs> it's Surah number 7, Ayah number 172, Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah 172. And when Allah took from the back of the children of Adam their, their, their children, and He made them witness of themselves. وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ He made them say shahada on behalf of themselves and upon themselves. عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ Am I not your Lord? قَالُوا بَنَا Read the ayah. They said, yes. Yes, Ya Allah. We testify that you are our Lord. Am I not your Lord? Yes, Ya Allah, you are our Lord. 
Allah says, so that you do not come on the day of judgment and say, I was unaware of this. Or you come on the day of judgment, أو تقول, or you would say, إنما أشرك أباؤنا من قبل. Our forefathers, our fathers were mushrikeen. And we came as their children. وَكُنَّا ذُرِّيَّةً مِّن بَعْدِهِمْ We were their children. أَفَتُهْلِكُنَا بِمَا فَعَلَ الْمُبْطِلُونَ Would you accuse us for what the falsifiers have done? This is, brothers and sisters, this essence of this conversation with Allah is what we call the fitrah. Interestingly, we don't remember it. So now we say, okay, Sheikh, we don't remember but Allah said it happened. Yes. How do I reconcile with that? I'll tell you how you reconcile with that. Do you remember when you were for nine months in your mother womb? That means it never happened. Do you remember the first two years of your life? Three? Maybe four, some has memories. That means you were never one, two, or three. You were born four years old. <laughs> not remembering does not mean it didn't happen. There's so many things in life. Sometimes someone told you, man, you told me this. And you're like, well, I don't remember. Unintentionally. We are forgetful. And of Allah's mercy, Allah on the day of judgment will not judge people based on this ayah, based on this conversation only. In another ayah, Allah gave more break to people. He said, I will not punish until I send a messenger first. وَمَا كُنَّا مُحَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا طيب. يا شيخ, Rasulullah came in Arabia 1400 years and gone. What about the Eskimos? <laughs> yes. If Allah Azza wa Jal sends the messenger of the messenger, you and I, go and speak to the Eskimos about what? About Islam and explain it in a way that they can understand it and relate to it in their language, then the hujja, the plea, the case has been established. But if no messenger comes to them, then Allah will not punish them on the Day of Judgment. Allah will give them a separate special trial. However, that special separate trial is with Allah's fairness. So if you are afraid, Ya Shaykh, what about all of these non-Muslims that never heard about Islam and this? I say, well, man, they got a good chance on the Day of Judgment. I would really be worried about myself. <laughs> I would be saying, Shaykh, I heard about Islam. Wallahi, I heard about, I read it every Ramadan and I read all the Sunnah and I'm not a good Muslim. That's a good question. But to say, all those people like, Yani, what are you trying to say? I have more mercy than Allah. I have more justice than Allah. How could Allah do this to them? Yeah, what, exactly what are you trying to say? You know, where did you get the sense of mercy except from Allah? Where did you get the sense of justice? Do you know that the, the sense of justice has been given to us from above us, not from under us? Look in the, look in the universe around us. You know, what? We evolved from apes? Okay, let's go back to apes. Do they have a sense of justice? You know, they made you think that chimpanzees are cute and they made them in movies. You know, chimpanzees are crazy criminals. They have no problem eating another monkey alive. And when one of them becomes weak, they have no problem turning on him and killing him. They eat meat. You know that. You want to watch some of the scariest movies, real ones, on YouTube? For those who you who like the adrenaline rush, go and see how chimpanzees go in groups and hunt other monkeys and eat them alive. Where is the justice in that? We don't get the sense of justice from anything under us. Do you know what happens when, when a new lion male comes to a pride? Do you know what's the first thing he does? He fights the old alpha male. If the old alpha male win, wins, he kicks him out. If the new guys defeat the alpha male or kill him, he will either run away or die in the battle. The new male will turn against every cup and baby of the old male and kill him on the spot. The mothers will be sad for three days. They will go back in heat 
and they will mate with the new male and they will have his own babies. Imagine if in the world of human beings, someone marry a divorced woman, first thing he goes, he goes down, kills all of her children so that she can have children with him. Where do we get the sense of justice? From Allah. From above us, not from under us. Nothing in creation has what we have. There's nothing in evolution that talks about justice. This is when Allah said, and I blow in him of my spirit, yani of my essence. We're not Allah. Our soul is not Allah, nor it's part of Allah. It's one of the creation of Allah. But Allah blew in us his essence. Allah Ar-Rahman, we, Ar-Rahim, we know what Rahman is. Allah is Al-Adil, we know what Adil is. Allah is Al-Muqsid, we know what Al-Qist is. You know, we know what fairness is, what justice is. We, 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 we have it. So why? Because Allah blew it in us. Nothing under us has Adil and justice and fairness. It doesn't exist. It's the survival of the fittest. Imagine if human being says the survival of this. Let's go to all poor people and kill them. That's the survival of the Tehidus. But we don't do that. So if you're worried about Allah's mercy and justice, I have an advice for you. Don't. So, that's why the way I also understand this ayah, and it's in the books of Tafsir, I will not punish until I send a messenger. This messenger is Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. But because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam is the last Prophet, if Allah sends you someone from the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam to remind you and wake you up, now Allah has sent you a messenger for you when you are alive. And he was alive too, who delivered the message of the final messenger to you. And that's why I have, in no way I do believe these lectures are entertainment, but actually milestones. You're either going to change after this, or you are in a lot of trouble. I'm not here to make you laugh. You will be held responsible about what you learned today. You cannot say, I didn't know, I didn't know what you knew. So these are milestones in your life for you to transform and change. And as well as for me, I'm the speaker, right? It looks to you like a privilege, but actually it's not. Because first one who goes to hell is a speaker. Mahalim. Allah tells him, why did you learn knowledge? He said, for you, Ya Allah, for your sake. Allah said, kevapt, liar. You learn so that you receive respect and kissing the hand and the bowing and touching the feet and bringing the food and the special rides and the special treatment and the special hosting and people say you are a alim and he's a sheikh and scholar and you loved it and enjoyed it you worked for that and you got your reward so here you have no reward you already got your jannah take him to hell so if you want to know the truth I am in I'm not excited at all to speak about this because it's a reminder for myself before me, I make dua for you, may Allah Azzawajal awaken you, I'll make you alert and aware, may Allah awaken the Iman inside you, and may Allah give me the same, you make dua for me, inshaAllah, we need each other, no one is better than no one here, um, inshaAllah, we're not here to make money, or to make fame, or to make a uh, legacy on the back of the Qur'an and Sunnah. We are here to make a legacy for Allah and for His Messenger, not for us, inshaAllah. First page is Alam al nasamat The Prophet says Allah took from the back of Adam, from his loin, his children, threw them like dots of light. And Adam said, Ya Allah, what is this? He said, those are your children. He was looking and looking and looking, and he saw one dot that has so much light, big dot of light. I'm amazed by this hadith, because if it was someone who's false, he would say, that big light was me. <laughs> but Rasulullah is not, he's a true, like truly true, and truly to the bones humble, to the bones. He said, 
Allah said, that is your son Dawood alayhi salam. So say, Adam said, wow, how long my son Dawood will live? Allah said, 60 years. Ya Allah, how long am I going to live? A thousand years. Allah, can you give him 40 years from my life to his life so he can live at least a hundred years? This much light, he needs more. So Allah said, done. Angel of death comes to Adam. Adam was the smartest human being because Allah taught him directly, right? People think, oh, we started in the cave, Abe's but <laughs> Adam was smart. I don't know what came before Adam. Allah kept it open for us, for science to find, right? People get to work so hard on this issue, but I know Adam was no primitive. He was no primitive. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا All the names. So Adam was by no means primitive. So Adam, one of his sciences was calculation. He knew, he knew calculation. He knew astronomy. He knew how to calculate. So he said to the angel of death, I still have 40 years left in my life. Angel of death went back to Allah. Ya Allah, your abd, Adam, and Nabi is saying, yes, tell 40. He said, go back and remind him of the 40 years that he donated for his son Dawood. Does he still want to fulfill the pledge or not? <laughs> and Adam said, yes. The Prophet ﷺ said, Adam forgot and his children forgot after him. Allah was not mad at Adam because he forgot. He just reminded him. That's what Allah teaches us. رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا Allah, don't hold us responsible if we forget or we make mistakes. Alhamdulillah, our deen is amazing, beautiful. Already easy. You try to make it easier, you will disturb it. It will not be easy. It will become nothing. So this is the hadith that we have about Alam al Samat, the world of dots of light in the back of Adam. Then we have the second stage, the ayah, when Allah takes from the back of the children from Adam of the children of Adam, yani mom and dad, and you and your wife, huh? Allah takes their children and he makes them witness of themselves. Am I not you, Lord? Yes, you are my Lord. So that so third stage is Alam al Arham, the world the world of the womb. I came from a womb, my mother womb, you came from your mother womb. In Alam al-Arwah, one hadith Allah said, Allah blows the spirit that has witnessed with its Lord, Allah blows the spirit in the body after 40 days. In another hadith, it says after 120 days. If we go with a lesser one, 40 days, it was interesting that I found out that in science, uh, the baby's heart start beating between 38, 39, 40 days of pregnancy. So subhanAllah, as if there is a relation between the heartbeat and blowing the spirit. 38, 39, 40, this is what I have found in the books of science. So it's very interesting. So the heart start beating, the soul is blown. And you come with a delegation, two angels come. Bring your pure soul, that dot of light, that soul, that witness with its Lord, whether you are coming to a Muslim parents or non-Muslim parents, this pure soul comes and is blown. And then they ask, Ya Allah, what's, how long is the life of this person? So Allah give the ajal, how long this person will live. Ya Allah, uh, what would be the rizq of this person? So Allah give him the rizq, obviously. The risk here is not only money, by the way. It's everything. Smartness. What's his gift? What's his strength? What's his weakness? What's her strength? What's her weakness? Because that's a risk too. Right? What's, right? So risk is also anything that comes to you and benefits you and becomes yours. Right? Uh, sometimes you go and make $8 an hour, $10 an hour, $12 an hour. It's not much. But that's your rizq. It's not a good money, but that's your rizq. So rizq doesn't have to be all good. Rizq is your... Huh? So it gives you a certain parameters of destiny. Date of birth, date of death. Yes. 
during this stage, Allah really, really awaken us. Because this stage we see. So Allah put so many lessons at that stage. Because we see. Before that we don't see. Allah used this stage to prove to you that there is life after death. Yani in Surah Al-Hajj, Ya ayyuhal nasu in kuntum fi raybin min al-ba'thi fa inna khalaqnakum min O mankind, if you were in doubt of life after death, then remember how we created you in the beginning from a clot. Why is this important? This is important because Islam, our deen, the way Allah teaches it in, through his book, the way his messenger teaches it, not the way anyone else teaches it, build your unseen iman, and iman bil ghayb, you believe in the unseen based on a proof in the seen world. This is the style of the Quran. It's not my style. I'm not making this, this stuff up. I'm not trying to be a modern, amazing, uh, latest and greatest, new age speaker. This is purely ayat of the Quran. Go back to Surah Al-Hajj and see how Allah made a case for you to believe in life after death by making a case for you to look at your mother womb at how the baby is made. Why? Because it's mind-boggling. Allah even gives it to us in another creation, the frog. Mother lays the egg. Father fertilizes the egg. The egg has to be outside the water, hanging on a leaf or next, above the lake. Sometimes they put their eggs inside the water, but it's still an egg. The frog will find a small pond and will put it. Some frogs put it in a leaf above the pond. So now what are you looking at? Egg. Where is the egg? Outside the water or inside. Okay. So now this egg comes out of it a tadpole. That looks more like a fish than anything else. Where does the tadpole? Falls into the water or starts swimming in the water? And it goes like that for a while. From what I remember, four weeks, or I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. But what are you looking at? Fish. Is it living outside water? No. What would happen if that tadpole gets outside water? It will die. What happens? Slowly, hands grow, feet grow, and it loses its tail, and it comes out of the water, and now it can only breathe outside water. It can hold its breath inside water, but it has to breathe where? <coughs> outside water. Yeah, and what is this? An egg of a chicken, or a fish, or a mammal, what is this? It's all of them together. This is ajeeb, right? This is interesting. This you moving from one form to another. If Allah told us, I will resurrect you on the day of judgment as fish, Everyone will say, oh, come on, that will not be a surprise to me. Why? Because what were you in your mother womb? An egg. Sperm and, 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 and the egg, right before meeting together and, you know, that the sperm was outside the egg, it sheds 23 chromosomes. You understand that no cell can live without 46 chromosomes. In a matter of a minute, it sheds and the egg sheds 23 chromosomes. So the 23 with the 23 will become what? 46. Now you have one cell. Now you have what? One cell. Now imagine, if you Google, just so that you don't, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm not any authenticity or authority on this cell. Google how many cells are in the human body. They will tell you, depends how you measure, but anywhere between 50 and 70 trillion cells. Thousand, billion, million cells, basically, a trillion. From one cell, 70 trillion? Yes. And each cell, the cells, as they're growing, this, this clot, this one cell, it's growing, and some cells are becoming specialty. These are liver. They look different. They act different. They do different jobs. And another cell becomes the kidney. They look different. They act different. 
Nearly the kidney is a miracle by itself. The kidney, your kidney size is like this. But if it actually allows itself to soak water, every cell to soak water that is capable, it will become like this. SubhanAllah, I know a sister, may Allah preserve her for her children. Had a pregnancy and delivered the pregnant, delivered the baby, alhamdulillah safe. Just so that you know, Wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah is capable of doing anything. The sister is 150 pounds. She became pregnant. She was, she became 180 pounds. When she was 150 pounds, 50 pounds were only her kidneys. If, if, if I don't know the sister, I will not tell the story. <laughs> so the kidneys were like from here to here, from here to here, full of water. That's the actual size of the kidney. But the way Allah created, they fold and fold and fold and fold and they filter water. If they unfold, it becomes this big. SubhanAllah. Just like they tell you, your DNA can go back to the moon, back and forth to the moon. I don't know, six times your the DNA in, in a cell or something. This is some things mind-boggling. Okay, fine. So, liver, kidneys, brain, this and this. And now, this baby is going first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. And what is the baby doing? The mouth is open, the nose is open. It's in a liquid. It's supposed to suffocate to death. No, it gets the water from the umbilical cord, it gets the food and the oxygen. So Allah says, look at that. Does that look like you? Do you look like mudra? When you take a gum, chew it, chew it, chew it, and then, you know, stretch it along your side here, fine and chew. You know how we like to play with gum. Mm -hmm. So you put it across here and you chew it and then take that out and look at it. That's called mudra. Chewed. Madh in Arabic, chewing. Mudra, chewed. And when you take that gum and go and look in any book of anatomy for children, that child looks exactly like a chewed gum. And those lines where your teeth, those lines in the chewed gum are actually the hands and the feet. And the first one is your tail. And yes, you have a tail. Like a tadpole. But then the tail becomes the spine and the feet and you don't have a tail. You had a tail, but now you don't have a tail. And now you come out not looking anything like that thing. So Allah says, if you came from this, why is it so strange for you that you're going to come back as a human again? I mean, where, where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Oh, that's impossible. Well, you know what's impossible? What already happened is the impossible. <laughs> So Allah says, if I created you like this in the first place, isn't it easy for me to create like this again? I mean, what's the problem? And then Allah Azza wa Jal goes in so many ways, like I have, that's a whole, we have a short time, but we have like nine to ten reasons, Quranic reasons, that will make you feel proud that you are a Muslim. It's unbelievable. Allah uses human logic, Reality logic and then tops it with divine logic. Allah tells you, look at this in reality and learn a lesson. One of the proofs in the Quran that there is life after death is look at a dead barren land and the rain falls, it comes back to life. Yani, just think for a second, where was that? That was dead. The Prophet ﷺ says, on the day of judgment, it will rain for 40 the narrator of the hadith, he said, I don't remember, 40 days, 40 days, I don't remember, I just remember the number 40, and as I remember, I will narrate it. It will rain for 40, and from that rain of ma'ul haya, the water of life, people will be resurrected. <coughs> you, we will come out like plants. So, if Allah makes that happen to you, you want to know, you want to look at the site of the Day of Judgment? Again, every issue of al ghaib that Allah asks you, gives you an example in Alam al-Shahada. You want to look at it? Look, before it rained this season, alhamdulillah for the abundant rain recently, because January, December, January, February, we had no rain. Then it started raining in March and April. But look how a barren mountain, yellow, becomes green. And this thing, just imagine those shoots of grass are human beings, that's it. <clears throat> because there will be no your mother become pregnant and for nine months and then she will deliver you there will be no pregnancy so what Allah will does what he does today in front of you every 
winter and spring, he will do it on day of judgment. What's the problem? If you were a dot and a clot, and then you became like a worm, right? A worm. And then you became like God knows what frog. And then you became like a fish. And then you became like a human. Yani it's a problem that you grow up like a plant. What already happened is more impressive. So Allah gives like this nine proofs in Al Quran Al Kareem. They're all mind boggling. You would think, oh, there's a smart speaker who came up with that, like in the year 2020. No, it's the Quran. That's what's impressive. That's what's impressive. But people sometimes, because they don't read the Quran, they try to go and find something impressive out there and then tell you. John Smith said, okay, I want to know what Rasulullah said. Maurice Bukai said, okay, fine, Jazallah khair, the Bible, the Quran, and science. But I want to know what Allah said. Comparative religion in the Quran. What did Allah say in the Bible, in the Quran? What did Allah say in the Torah, in the Quran? Even comparative religion is already in the Quran. Authentic source. Allah who revealed the Torah tells you, I said this in the Torah. In the Quran, He tells you that. You don't need don't go and be fighting with people over their book. <coughs> this is my book says this. Khalas. But see, Sheikh, they don't believe in the Quran. We have to speak to them from the Bible. Wallahi, mashallah. If you figured out something, Rasulullah didn't figure. Show me one day the Prophet said, okay guys, you don't believe in the Quran. You know, let's bring the Bible and let's prove Islam is right from your Bible. When did that ever happen? When did the Sahaba do that? And you think it turns people? No, it doesn't. But that's a different topic. So we are in stage number? Two. Four. Four. The scholars have differed between two, three, and four. four. Stage number one, the world of Nasamat. Nasama, dots of light, simple rule. The world number two, Alam al arwah World number three, Alamul Arham, plural of Rahim. And here is something interesting that Allah gave women something, and the Prophet said he gave her something, and that thing he gave it a name from his name. From the name Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, he gave it Ar Rahim. That's not me, that's a hadith. So every woman should walk with her head high, feel so special and honored, she carries one of Allah's names inside her. It just doesn't get any better than that. That's why Allah and His Messenger in the Quran always use the example of the mother's love. No one will love you more than your mother than Allah, except Allah. Anyone else will not. Why? Because, and, and why? Why the mother? Because she brings something to life inside her group from, SubhanAllah. When Allah brings, creates people from nothing to life, Allah feels so much pity, mercy, Love, care, and that's why Allah calls, told the Prophet, I am Rabbuka, Iqra bismi Rabbika al-Ladiha, I'm your Lord. I'm Rabbukum, I'm your Lord, I'm your caretaker, I'm your, SubhanAllah. So Alam al-Arham, why we call it Alam, why we call it a world? How many people don't make it past Alam al-Arham? Some of us died in their mother wombs. The mother had a miscarriage, the baby didn't make it. So Islamic rule is very simple. If you make it, if the baby comes out and makes one scream, one scream, one breath, one scream, and then it passes away, we should make ghusl, we should make salat al janaza and bury him. If the baby is born, stale birth, and did not have a breath or scream outside his mother, then we owe it only burial. It's not in need of us washing it or praying on it. It doesn't need your washing, it doesn't need your prayers. It's already a burden Jannah. So have a nice day, bury it and go home. You understand? So that's a simple rule of fiqh that helps us to understand the subject. You know, so we call it istahalla am lam yastahil. Istahalla yani 
بالصراخ او بالبكاء او this did the child make a sound did he cry when you have you owe it washing day and janaza and day if not you just only owe it day and that's it so some of us don't make it subhanallah may allah may allah strengthen her iman and may allah if it's his will to bless her with another child is this sister who embraced islam in my home subhanallah she was graduate she was a lawyer graduate from uc davis um, and got married had a daughter one pregnancy miscarriage two pregnancy miscarriage third pregnancy a boy and perfect and one week before birth the umbilical cord turned around its arm not even its neck squeezed the thing and the baby passed away he was one week away from delivery very hard and he, she called me and this and that subhanallah very difficult may allah fix her iman and her yaqeen replace her with something better in dunya and akhirah it's very interesting so it's a whole stage of life you come to the womb you live in the womb right and then allah tells us learn from that more a child imagine if a twin are sitting down inside the mother womb they're having good time they're just hanging together they're having social and then doctor comes and pulls out one of them and imagine we go inside and interview the next the other one where's your brother oh my brother died they took him out no he didn't die he was one no he was here with me he was having a good time we were eating and drinking and we had our own world and everything was good and perfect but why did they have to take him out subhanallah you are born from your mother womb into this world and when you're born in this world a time comes that you are born in another world in the Quranic Arabic mouth and mayyit does not refer to nothing mouth and mayyit refers to the state of the soul without the body so Allah says كيف تكفرون بالله وكنتم أمواتا فأحياكم ثم يميتكم ثم يحييكم ثم إليه ترجعون how do you dare to disbelieve in Allah when you were dead then he brought you to life then he caused you to die then he brought you back to life then to him you shall return dead does not mean nothing dead you have a soul but you don't have a body that's the meaning of the word dead in the quran when you come to this world from death you don't come from nothingness you come from a soul without a body so we come here we have a soul and a body and we're born into this world subhanallah we're born crying different reason in the hadith shaitan pokes you in another you know it is science tells us it's the first time you use your lungs they expand them like a balloon and they hurt you so much that you have to scream because it's the first time you've used your lungs you know the children try their mother want to go <laughs> they try to breathe but you know there's no vacuum of air so anyway different reasons but then you come to this life and you cry you're crying so hard and what's everyone doing around you laughing hey where the baby and the baby is like why are you laughing i am crying <laughs> so the arab poet muslim arab poet said a poem that is so beautiful so profound profound he said your mother gave birth to you o son of adam O oh, daughter of Adam, your mother gave birth to you crying while everyone around you was laughing. Work hard for a day that when everyone is crying, you are laughing. That's the day of your death. وَلَدَتْكَ أُمُّكَ يَبْنَ آدَمَ بَكِيًا وَالنَّاسُ حَوْلَكَ يَضْحَكُونَ سُرُورًا فَعْمَلْ لِيَوْمٍ أَن تَكُونَ إِذَا بَكَوْ في يوم موتك ضاحكا مسرورا. so that's the the poet and it's very profound like someone who read the Quran and ayat and brought beautiful share. prophet used to encourage that sallallahu alaihi wasallam. so we come to this world 
And very interesting how we come to this world. I ask you, what makes you, you? How do you identify yourself? How do you know it's you, not him? How do you know this is me? How do you identify yourself? When you're walking down the street, how do you identify yourself? How do you know it's me? Can anybody enlighten us? Your name. Thank you. Your name. You call me by my name, I respond. That's how I know it's me. Yes. Same thing. Yalla, more. That's your name. More. Your body. I, my body, I know this is my body. What's the most identifying part of my identifying part of my body? Your ish? I know someone say like this. Someone say your face. Your face, yes. When you look in the mirror, you know it's you. At least I hope so. You know? <laughs> There's actually a disease. May Allah never test us like that. That the person doesn't remember his face. And every time they look in the mirror, they get very scared. So they are not allowed to have mirrors in the room. So imagine, subhanAllah, just for us to Allah to tell us, you could have that, you know. Your face, your name, more. Your conscience, right, more. And the jeans that you're wearing, or like genetics. <laughs> I don't know my genetics, so that would be a problem if the only way I can identify myself with my genes. Okay, what else? Ah. My unique experience, how I see the world, how I perceive. It. That's how I understand. When you go to apply for a credit card, what do they ask you? Huh? Social Security. What is other than Social Security? Picture ID. Picture ID. What is other than fingerprints? Okay, fingerprints. What? I've never, they never asked me about fingerprints. Where do you come from? Where? What? Signature. You're missing it. Come on. The first thing that they ask you to identify yourself. Your parents. Your name. Thank you for saying your parents. No, what is it? When you fill the application, what do you write? First name, last name. Thank you. Finally, date of birth. Come on, people. You went for social security number and you forgot your date of birth? America really got to you. Date of birth, face, who your parents were. Go around that your parents were. Also, where were you born that shaped who you are? What language you spoke when you were a kid? And what language did the parents speak? Because we put the language is a way of thinking. That's why I tell you, teach your children their mother tongue before you teach them English, with teaching them English, but make them think. Because that's part of who you are as a Muslim too, your language, right? Number three, okay, your childhood, how did you grow up? Which country did you grow up in? What makes you, you? Yeah. What about your voice, right? Your look, your parents, who were your brothers and sisters, they, all of these things made you who you are, true? You know, when one of us, Jazakallah khair, when uh, when one of us um, when you When one of us is proud of himself, oh, who is she? I am such and such. My parents are such and such. My family are such and such. I come from this country. I come from this part of the town. We had this much money. We were upper family, high class. We were, this is how you take pride in yourself. <coughs> when someone comes and tells you, would you please come into the path of Allah? See it, 
embrace it. See the beauty. No, I have my opinions. You know what? I'm not. I'm. You know, I'm. I'm a Muslim, but I'm not religious. I'm kind of, you know, spiritual, but not religious, and all of that stuff. But would you? No, 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 no. I have my own opinions. I have my own ideas. You know. Okay, where did you get your opinions and ideas? From where you lived, where you've been, what you've learned, right? That's what makes you you. And if Allah has granted you or her with a beautiful voice, may Allah give you enough brain and iman to balance that good look. Because when you have a good look and you don't have enough brain and iman to balance it, that good look will be a curse on you. Because you will think you're somebody when you're nobody. But just because your whole life people think, oh, you're beautiful, and they're opening doors for you and they're talking, you think the world owe you something because you're beautiful and you have not achieved any of that. But here is what I want you, a moment of reflection. Do you know what makes you, you? You have nothing to do with it. You have no choice in it. Did you pick your parents before you come to this world? Did you pick the country? Where were you going to be born? When were you going to be born? What language will you speak? What class? What part of town? Did you even give yourself your own name? Subhanallah. Allah says a word in the Quran, an ayah, insan, O human being, ma kareem. What made you deceived? about your Lord. You're talking to your Lord like you are the God and your Lord is no one. What makes you talk like that? What what got you into this arrogance? He is the one الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك He's the one who created you, shaped you. This look that you're so proud of, He gave it to you. فعدلك He straightened you up gave you strength, gave you special talents, and then Allah said, فِي أَيِّ صُورَةٍ مَا شَاءَ رَكَّبَ In whatever shape and mold He assembled you. I find myself, Allah picked this soul, okay, we have this soul, uh, this is the body, this is how it's going to look, or she will look, uh, this will be their parents, okay, they will be born here, she will be growing up here. This will be his date of birth. He's going to go through his childhood. And Allah assembled you, put you together. He knew you before you knew yourself. It's mind-boggling. Like he literally, literally wanted you to look like that. And there is a beauty in that, and you have to see that. No matter what you consider yourself beautiful or not, if Allah picked it, it must be beautiful. And that's why, you know, <laughs> the people that we consider ugly or maybe handicapped or we call retarded, if you just give yourself five minutes and look, you will see beauty in them. Allah doesn't create ugly. But there is something for you to see and reflect. SubhanAllah. So, be happy, be satisfied of what Allah chose for you and how He assembled you, your height, body build, parents, social status, where were you born, what language did you speak, what nationality, how Allah assembled you together. And Allah told you, none of these items I will judge you for on the Day of Judgment. I will not ask you about any of this because you had nothing to do with it. I will ask you about four things. What did you think about? What did you say? What did you do? How did you react? Yes. Because Allah is not going to ask you why the day was before the night, why the night was before the day, why the moon was revolving around this, the earth, not the earth revolving around it's not, and you didn't do any of that. You have no responsibility, the day, the night, the sun, the moon, you just look at them as ayat. But what would Allah ask you? You chose to think like that. I told you not to think like that. 
I told you, don't keep on living suspicion, 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 always about people. You look at suspicious, 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 suspicious. Who thinks like Allah said? Avoid most of suspicion and conjecture for most, not all, most of suspicion is a sin. Sin. So, hmm, you might think negatively of people. Huh? Some of suspicion is what? Sin. Oh, Allah will judge us for what's in our head, yes. If it translates to an action. So if in my head, lower class. Now the thought translated into an action, I will be judged. Even though I didn't say a word. Oh, oh I don't talk to such people. Oh, you're not you know, educated like us. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, she might not be knowing what she's talking about this subject, but she might know a hundred things more than you in a hundred areas. So, again, everyone, Allah gave them something special. You can learn something from everyone. SubhanAllah, people ask me question, I learn from their question more than they learn from my answer. Because it teaches you something, right? So you have to think. So Allah Azza wa tells us, man, you, you, when you say me, me, I assembled you. I can disassemble you. And I will disassemble you. I will take your soul out of your body. And I'm going to be talking to that soul again. Just like it bear witness the first time, I'm going to make it bear witness the second time. I'm going to talk to it the second time. So, subhanAllah brothers and sisters, Allah brings you to life. Allah gives you four resources to accomplish four things. First resource, Allah gives you time. You need time to do things from birth to death, to death, excuse me. Number two, Allah gives you wealth because you need wealth to execute things, to live and execute. Number three, Allah gives you knowledge, mind, and to the mind, knowledge. And Allah will see what you have done with that knowledge. Number four, Allah will give you health and youth, so that you can do what you're supposed to do. As long as you can move, move, and function, you're young. Second, you can, you can only sit down and you cannot move anymore. That's a different issue. But it has nothing to do with age. Age is in your head. To me, from the Quranic understanding, who is young? Who is young? The definition of young is the one who can change very quickly. They're young. They don't know much. But if something that they see, it's right and it's good, they embrace it. They'll change like that. By Allah, I saw in my life, 60, 70 years old, they are looking for change. They are agile. They see they were doing something wrong for 60 years, 70 years. It doesn't matter. They change. They embrace change. Those people are young. You look at their faces, by Allah, there is barely any wrinkle. And you look at a 16 years old. Can you please just like stop harming yourself? No, that's me. That's the way I am. Take it or leave it. I know myself. That's the way I am. I will not change. You won't change. I don't prescribe to that. You look in their face, it's all wrinkled. What is young? Young means someone who is willing, ready to change to the truth very quick, very fast. So long as you, when you talk to yourself, if you ever catch yourself talking to yourself, I don't do that, I'm like, I'm just, I've been doing the same thing, I don't care what Allah said in the Quran and with the hadith, the way I learned the Quran and hadith from my mom and dad is this way and I'm going to do it this way, I'm going to continue this way, I don't know this new generation and this and that. 
and you start making it old versus young and cultural versus non-cultural, you are old. Congratulations. You're gonna die soon. But if you are like, man, I love the truth. I don't like lies. Allah created me. I don't like lies. I don't like someone to lie to me. So why when it comes to the truth, I want people to lie to me? Thank you, Allah, for not lying to me. You don't lie. Your word is the truth. Your promise is the truth. You are the truth. What is the truth? It is when you say something that matches reality. In real, in the real world, it's this. So people thought for a long time, Earth is flat. In the real world, Earth was a globe. It didn't matter. It didn't hurt the feelings of Earth that everyone was describing it as flat. The Earth was a globe. Was that the truth? No. Why? Because it was not matching reality. In reality, whether people say it or not, admit it or not, believe it or not, embrace it or not, there is only one God. That's just the reality of things. There is only one God. So that's why this point is very important. When you say, what, what, what will make you make it across is willingly, without any force or compulsion, with knowledge and choice. You make an informative decision. You make an informative and informed, not informative, informed choice, informed decision, willingly, that inside me, my head, my mind, inside my heart, and inside my soul, there is no God but one God. Why? Do you know what we grew up learning? If you say there is no God but one God, out there, those Hindu gods, and those this Buddhist gods, and those this, they are not true, there is only one God out there. Do you know you? that's not what it is? Like, you haven't added anything by saying, La ilaha illallah, and you mean out there in the world there is no God but one God. Because anyway, out there in the world there is no God but one God. But the question is, is in the world inside you, is there no God but one God? That's what Allah will judge you for. So what we do, we say, out there in the world, there is no God but one God. I'm done. I can go on with my life right now. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you later. But inside you, nothing changed. <clears throat> And you think you've done your job as a Muslim. No, you didn't. You didn't make a choice. You didn't make a change. That's why when you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, and inside you, oh my God, there will be so much change. People cannot be God. What people say about you cannot be God. Money cannot be God. Fame cannot be God. Wealth cannot be God. What's in your side is la ilaha illallah. So the Prophet would say la ilaha illallah a hundred times a day. لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو على كل شيء قدير. There is no God but one God. He is alone. There is no partners for him. He owns everything. I shall not be blinded. People might own powers, superpowers. They might think that they own, but no one owns but Allah. Let me make that fact clear inside me. Who owns Allah? Who is God? Allah. Who is the Lord? Allah. Who deserves thankfulness? Allah. Who's the king? Allah. Inside me. Let me not get deviated. Let me not get scattered. Let me not get divided. Let me, let me focus here. Inside me, I want to live my life. And this issue, this choice that Allah wants us to make, informed choice, is why you are here. People say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. وَأَشْهَدُوا أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم I ask you a question. What's the meaning of Ashhadu? I am a witness. Can someone explain to me what's a, who's a witness? What is the meaning of witness? When do we use the word witness? Huh? And at court. We call the witness. What do we want from the witness? About what? <clears throat> it's something. So he must be someone who saw something. He must be someone who heard something. He must be someone who 
known something. He must be someone who experienced. So the judge asked him, uh, Mr. Witness, uh, have you seen the crime? No. Have you heard the crime? No. Do you know anyone that is involved in this crime? No. Have you been in the vicinity of the crime? No. Do you know anything about this crime? No. Can you get out of here, please? <laughs> so I ask people, your entire life, you think Islam is easy, and that's why you don't value it. You think it's a piece of cake. Anyone can get it. It's easy for the one whom Allah made it easy for, and the one Allah makes it easy for is the one who wants it, who desires it, who, who sincerely wants it. Otherwise, it's not easy to get. I'm telling you, it makes you, gives you headache. When you have headache, that's a good headache. Okay, it means you're thinking. You're saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu an Rasulullah. Can you please tell me what did you see? What did you hear? What did you experience? You're just talking? Words have no meanings? I bear witness that there's no God that will. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let's bring you here. What did you witness? You first have to witness, see, hear, experience, know. And that's why you say Ashhadu. That's why Islam is the final faith and the true faith. You know why? Because there's no blind faith in Islam. If you want to go like this, get out. Go find another religion. You want to open your eyes and see, we'll come to Islam. You can say Ashhadu. You want to close your eyes and say, that's the way it is? I believe it or not? Have a nice. You want to seek the truth? Ahlan wa sahlan. You want to just say, this is what I found my forefathers. This is what everybody around me did and I'm doing it? Go find another place. That's why I love Islam. It's very academic. Like it's very proper, academic, scientific. Like even when you believe in Allah, you have to say, I bear witness that there is no God. But one God. And mine. That's the thing that will make you survive on the day of judgment and enter Jannah. That you witnessed it, saw it, heard it, experienced it, known it. You've known it, right? And you lived it. And you tried your best to live it. Maybe you didn't. You're not a perfect person. You're not a prophet or messenger. You're not, you're not even close, right? But you had the niya, tried, did your best. Allah says, that's all what I want to do. Just do your best. I'm not asking for perfection. So what happens is that you are in the state of witnessing. So what happens? You move to the second step of witnessing when people look at you. They will witness Allah. They will witness Islam. They will witness the Prophet. The Prophet said say there are some people when you see them, you remember Allah. When you see them, you see the messenger in them. When you see them, you say, I don't know what this guy believes in. I don't know what this lady, I just had a conversation, visited a lady, subhanAllah, had an aneurysm. The doctor, 10 years ago, told her, you need to have a surgery. You need to. You need to she said, "Okay, hold on. I don't want to have the surgery right now." Are you crazy? No. Then the doctor told her, looked at her, and said, "Is it your faith?" She said, "Yes." He said, "Do you know that when I tell people they have aneurysm, the first thing, when can we have the surgery? Please, let's have the surgery right now. You are the only one that I have to run after you to make the surgery. What, what, what kind of a human you are?" She said, "I have faith." I want to have the surgery, I want medicine. It's not that I don't want it, but I don't. Something in me say, don't do it now. When the time to come to do it, she did it. And it was the perfect timing. Her doctor said, you know, whatever God you're worshiping, he answered your prayers. Had we did the surgery a year earlier, we would have done something to you. Because the aneurysm, the blood moved out of the dangerous area. Well, whoever was talking to you, telling you don't do have the surgery right now, he was telling you the truth. 
it moved out. Usually when it moves out, it does more damage. It actually moved from the dangerous area. So I was able to go in, remove the blood, nothing happened. Two months later, after she did the surgery, they discovered she has a tumor in her uterus. They said, we hope it's not a cancer. They go, look, it first hit, now the second hit. Her brain, her cut in the skull still did not heal. And now they have to go and open her again two months, two and a half months. Before the two months, before the surgery, they said, when do we do the surgery? Shall we do it back tomorrow? She said, no, 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 I already have my tickets to visit my family. I need to go to Ethiopia and visit my family. Are you okay? No. Are you in your right mind? Yeah, yeah. nothing is going to happen, I know. Let me just have the surgery after I come back. She went, had the blast with her family, good time, came back, had the surgery, no cancer. Alhamdulillah, Had she freaked out the first time, she would have lost. Had she freaked out the second time, it would have been for no reason. But that's what happens to us. From something is you, you freak out. Why? Calm down. Ask Allah. Have Iman. So that's why those people, a lady like this, her doctor told her, is it your faith? And then comes back after surgery and says, the God that you were praying to answered your prayer. Because if I did the surgery just a year ago, I would have killed you or paralyzed you. SubhanAllah. That's why, brothers and sisters, we are here to see this universe, this universe in front of you, look at it, and witness that there is no God between God. Look at the sky, look at it at night, and say, there is no God between God. Look at yourself and say there is no God but you. Look at your life story, your destiny, and say there is no God but one God. Look at the good and the bad, and see the good as good, the bad as good, and become a testimony. <coughs> to the testimony that there is no God but one God. Inshallah, if Allah wills, I will maybe come back sometime. It is about this, how to live life with La ilaha illallah. I teach a course, alhamdulillah, process of finishing the book. Live in peace or live in pieces. Yeah. That's the name of the course, that's the name of the book, inshallah. Because that's, we are not able to explain ourselves to ourselves, to the Muslims. A Muslim who's lost, he wants to come back to Allah. What's for me in it? Nothing. You're just going to pray and die. Thank you. I'll go back to what I was doing. A non-Muslim comes. What's for me in it? You just submit to Allah. Then when you die, you go to Jannah. Thank you. I'm going to go back to where I was. We're not able to explain ourselves. The beauty of our faith. And if you were to summarize the fruit of there is no God but one God, the fruit of it is you become one. Because you can become ten easily in life. Oh my God, my income is gone. Oh my God, my health is gone. Oh my God, my loved one, my son, my son, daughter, my father. Oh my God, this is happening. Oh my God, I'm going to be, oh, they're going to fire me. Oh, this. Next thing you know, you are ten, not one. Or you can say, oh my God, and that's it. <laughs> and you will take care of the rest. So you either live in peace or you live in pieces. It's your choice. So that's why, brothers and sisters, yani, this La ilaha illallah and what comes out of it, it's really fruitful, fruitful, like fruitful. I'm telling you, your iman pays off. This hit with another hit is usually how life tries you. If Allah wills, this is what I have observed in the stories, I might be wrong, this observation. When it is one hit, when it's one hit, usually the person is gone. And that's Allah's will. And if he's a good person, alhamdulillah, he will go or she will go to Jannah. When it's multiple hits, that means you're going to survive. People, when they have, you know, I knew this lady, Egyptian lady, 
there isn't a single body organ that she has that she didn't do a surgery for, including her brain, heart, liver, lungs, anything you want, she's done it. And after the surgery, you look at her like she's never done surgery before in her life. Some, some ridiculous number of surgeries, but she survived. And she reached a long age, old age, then she passed away, like everybody else. So usually, you know, people, you know, people, would you rather take one hit and be gone or take multiple hits and at least survive around, right? But your faith pays off, I'm telling you, your pays, it pays off in dunya, and it pays off in your grave, it pays off on the day of judgment, and it pays off the ultimate payoff, which is Jannah. But you remember, before you go to Jannah, there's so much payoff before that here in dunya, now, here. Here, because not everyone who's alive lives the same way. There's someone who's living in peace, and there's someone who's living in war inside him or her. It's not the same. It's they're not the same, the people of heaven, the people of hell. The people of heaven, you look at them, they know. They are going through misery. Bombs are falling on them. You look at them, you realize this person is in a state of someone who looks going. To. It's not. It's not like, oh, the people of heaven, they have no bala, and they're having it, and they're having an amazing, perfect life. When there is an amazing, perfect life, that's when I go, oops, when, when is it going to hit? Because life, there's no, there's no amazing thing. So if things are going perfect, and that's, you know, I was scared before my sickness, because it was going perfect for a while. I'm like, Ya Allah, please, 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 Ya Allah. What happened? I used to get so sick when I was a kid from age like 17 to age 24, nothing but sickness. This last sickness, it was a walk in the park compared to what I was going through. I come to America at age 25 and I stopped getting sick, all the way to 45. I'm like, Ya Allah, please, not even a flu, some fever. <laughs> Purify, Ya Allah, please, nothing. I wanna say I have fever, I can't say that. Then Allah Azza wa Jal gives you something to purify. If, if things, who wants things to go perfect, right? SubhanAllah, people go to the movies for fun. Imagine you walk into the movie and everything from beginning to end in the movie is perfect. They get married. They fell in love with each other. Oh man, they're going to get in trouble. They don't get in trouble. Oh man, someone else is going to come and take. Nobody comes and takes it. Oh man, this, after a while, like, where is the plot? Where the hell is the movie? Where is this thing? You were going to walk out. I need some action. Come on, make it, make it go wrong. Three hours you will not last without things go crazy. Spice it up, man. Put something. Let them fight each other. And yet, you get married. And you want it happy ever after. <laughs> Who wants that? It's the fight that spices it up and then makes you angry. I hate you, I hate you too. You know, this and then, and then after that, you know, I'm sorry. Then, yeah, man, I love you more than ever. Right? Can we fight again? <laughs> That's what real life is. People are like chasing. Who wants, who wants no problems? You know, people who have no problem, they're all depressed. You want a problem in you. You want something to get you busy, right? To be solving something. I'm listening to National Public Radio. This girl inherited six million dollars. She felt her life was uh, uh, fake. She went and donated the six million dollars, went and got a job, went to college, working in this. She loved the struggle, working and school work. She graduated, started a small business, didn't work, went and got a job, made money, came back, started another business, and this, and then she started a business. What's the business? Healing the children of rich people. Hassan <laughs> Billah on National Public Radio, NPR. <laughs> she said, I'll go to a person, you know, millionaire, what's the allowance of the kid? $100,000 a month. <laughs> So she said, the first thing I tell them, look at me. Do I look happy? I'm very happy. I struggle every day. You don't want this life with no struggle. Who wants that? So she started a business healing the children of rich people by getting them out of that richness, telling their parents, take your money and go away. 
Bill Gates left nothing for his children almost like the guy 54 billion the second he dies his children are barely left with 20 million and he regrets leaving them Imam Shafi'i said one sub work hard the sweetness of life is in working hard and struggling not in ease who wants ease so brothers this is our life here and we are here to bear witness that there is no God but one God and we are here to be witnesses for others to see what does it mean that there is no God but one God? It means that I'm just to the best of my ability, that I'm fair, that I'm merciful, that I'm good, that I stand up against evil, that I'm there for you. This is I'm witnessing, I'm a witness. So people see that in my actions. So I bear witness and I become witness. Allah asks us both in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, kunu qawwameena bil qisti shuhada alillah. O you who believe, be people who stand up for justice, witnesses for Allah, not witnesses of Allah, witnesses for Allah. Yani people will see you and say, my God, he believes in a beautiful. Look at you, look from the ends of the world, Bangladesh, God, Burma, China, look at you. Why did your parents become Muslims? Because they witnessed the Sahara. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, why? Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turk, why did they become Muslim? The Tatar came from the heart of Mongolia and Kazakhstan to destroy the Muslim world. When they were done destroying them, they're like, man, we destroyed the best civilization on earth. They are human, we're savages. They came back Muslims. They came to kill every last one of us. We should have been gone a long time ago. Then those Mongol, which in Urdu Mughal, comes and unite India and bring Islam to you. The people who came to destroy us and finish us once and for all. We were witnesses. Even our enemy learned from us, embraced us, who the one who came to us ended up carrying our message and going back and spreading it in a part of the world that it never reached before to the depth of China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan. The foundation of Tatar, Kazakhstan, is a Muslim country. Russia is 150 ethnicity. That's what makes Russia, Russia. 70 out of the 150 are Muslim Tatars. Half of Russia are Muslims. Do you know that? They were ruling that region. Then the Tsars came and took it over. But they stayed Muslims. Whoever of you heard of Bashkiristan? Crazy country called Bashkiristan. A sister in our community, Alia. Where are you from? Bashkiristan. I said, I've never here heard of that. Haji. And there is a town called Bashkir. They are part of Russia. A Tatar Muslim state minority. That's what makes Russia Russia. We don't know our own greatness. That's what makes your grandparents become Muslim. Because they witness someone who stands up for the truth. They say, I want to become like you. So then the Prophet ﷺ said, You will not move on the day of judgment until Allah asks you for four things about your time, your wealth, your youth, and your knowledge. The four resources that Allah gave you in dunya. Now, from here, we move to stage number four. Alam al-Nasamat, Alam al-Arwah, Alam al-Maham, al-Dunya, and then, right? Nasamat, Arwah, Rahim, Dunya, and then al-Barzakh, or Alam al-Qubur. Alam al-Barzakh is an interesting Alam. Barzakh means barrier. You're not in dunya, nor you are in the day of judgment. You are in between. How do we get an alam al barzakh? We die. How do we die? It depends. If you're a believer, it pays off big time. If you are an unbeliever, intentionally and evil and criminal, you're going to get the wrong payoff. People think when they die, angel of death shows up, 
snatches their soul and leaves. Allah would not do that to a believer. Believe it or not. If you know your value to the world, the Prophet ﷺ said, the end of the world will not come so long as there is one person who says, La ilaha illallah. We are the reason why the world is not ending. Because Allah will not let a believer witness the horrors of the end of the world. Allah will not let you witness the collapse of the solar system. Will not let a believer witness that. That's how valuable you are in the eyes of Allah. Allah will not let you go through the horror. So when it comes to dying, Allah will not let you go through the horror. The Prophet ﷺ said, when the person is close to akhirah and leaving dunya, Allah sends a delegation. Abd, mu'min, mu'mina, Allah sends a delegation of the angels of mercy. So they line up in front of him in his sight, in his foresight, and they turn their faces to him. Their faces, each one is like the full moon, smiling at him. And they bring with them clothes, beautiful, from Jannah, water from Jannah, perfume and hanout that we use to put on the dead person so that to give him a good scent from Jannah. So the person looks at them and they say, you're beautiful, your faces are enlightened. Who are you in God's name? They say, we are the angels, the angels of mercy. Who's clothes that for? Oh, these are your clothes. Who's that water from? It shines like a pearl, like a diamond. Oh, this is your, this is your water. We, why? We, you are about to die, and once you die, we will wash you, put the perfume, and put the clothes on you. So what, can I, can I wear them? You have to die first. Can I please die? <laughs> this is the reaction of the believer. Can I please die? They say, just wait a second, the angel of death will come and will take your soul. Okay, I'll wait. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, the person will feel what you feel from a pinch. And the soul will leave the body. And the shower will start. Imagine, delegation of angels, taking angels taking care of you, showering you, putting perfume on your ruh, on this essence of you, in your consciousness, on this ruh, that is actually substance, there is substance, but we don't know that substance. What is it made of? And then they will put the clothes in you, and then that group of angels will go up in a delegation, the angels, with your soul, carrying it in the best clothes, best wash, best perfume, and when you reach to the gate of the first sky, they will, the, the angels of the sky, the first sky has gates. I don't know if that's what they call today black holes, but it has gates. And on these gates there are angels. And the angels start uh, 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 asking, who is this person? And the Prophet ﷺ said, they call him with the most beloved name to him. Why? To feel home. So if your name is Aisha, but your mom used to call you Ishi, they will say, this is Ishi with us. So you feel, oh my God. They call me with my most beloved name to My God, I feel home. My mom used to call me that. فَيَدْعُونَهُ بِأَحَبِّ الْأَسْمَاءِ إِلَيْهِ The Prophet Sallallahu They will call him with the most beloved name to him. Yeah, you're spoiling him. And then they will say to the angels, the angels who are holding the gates of the first sky, they will say to the angels who are carrying your soul, they will say, come from here, enter from this gate. And the other group they will say, no, 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 come from our gate. And the other group will say, no, 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 please, come from our gate. Our gate is beautiful. Imagine when you are welcomed, you walk into a city, and someone says, come and stay with my home. They're like, no, 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 come and stay with my home. You feel, my God, so welcome. Am I so welcome that much? That's so humbling. So you enter through one of these gates, only to experience that in the second sky. Who is this? He's Fulan, such a Fulan. Fulana, the daughter of Fulan. And they call you with your most beloved name. Can you come please enter from here? Honor above honor, above honor, above honor, seven skies. And then the soul with the angels of mercy meets its Lord. And Allah welcomes you. Ah. 
يا ايتها النفس المطمئنه ارجعي الى ربك راضيه مرضيه سبحان الله فدخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي سو الله سيز تو ذا نفس ويلكم يو هاف بليزد مي and i am pleased with you and i will please you but i have taken an oath upon myself from earth i have created you to earth i will return you and from earth i will resurrect you again so go back with pleasure welcome in my kingdom and you the angels take you in a similar journey down back to your grave and after you have met your lord and had this pleasant conversation do you think you're going to have a problem answering the two the answers the questions of the two angels who's your lord you've just met your lord who's your prophet <laughs> you've just talked about your prophet what's your milla al islam it would be very easy and then As Allah said, Allah will tell the angels, now this is the soul. There's no more the physical dimension, height, depth, width, and time. No more. We're not talking about that anymore. Now we're talking, Allah says, expand his grave. SubhanAllah. Why do people hate death? You know what? Who can share with me? Why do people hate death? And what comes after death? What's... what's makes muslim or non muslim what makes you hate them what makes people hate them the unknown jazakallah khair the unknown why do people hate the grave i'm sorry what is it you say attachment to dunya why attachment to dunya because of its pleasures It's beauty. Okay. You don't want to leave the pleasures and the beauty. Why do people don't want to be buried in the grave? They don't want to be scared. Scared. Why? Loneliness. That's one. Give me another. Darkness. Another. Small. You have dirt all around you. Six feet under. surrounded by dirt locked so people go for cremation yeah. and mausoleum they don't want to be under the ground this bugs decomposing for everything that you've mentioned Allah and his messenger give you an antidote an answer to that six feet under becomes seven heavens above narrow small becomes vast the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said expands the grave because it's not your body that is looking it's not the eyes of your body it's that your soul can go through the wall no problem your soul can go through the wall So the soul is looking and there is no edges it's no more small It's not dark because Allah sends angels to enlighten your grave with their light And it's not lonely the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says when you are in your grave someone walks in Wow you look so beautiful so handsome your clothes are so beautiful and your smell is even better who are you i don't know you who are you and that person say i am your good deeds you were busy giving me company in dunya and now i will be busy giving you company in your grave let's talk do you remember that day when you were walking and you saw a poor person and you said man i've eaten he hasn't eaten and you give him just you went and bought for him for a dollar or two and then he displays the tape in front of you oh my god i forgot that that was nothing no it was nothing for you but in the eyes of allah it was big 
Do you remember when you had a, a Muslim friend and nobody knew that he was in trouble and you went and helped him and gave him $500? Oh my God, I totally forgot that. Oh, you forgot, but Allah didn't. And you stay in a conversation with this person about your life, your good deed. That's why if I were you, brothers and sisters, and I am one of you, I will be busy doing something good every day. It's going to come back and give you company when it's very boring because there will be nothing to do. So, subhanAllah, the grave. When you sit in your grave, Allah opens two windows, and they are 4D windows, display. 3D, you see the thing popping up. 4D, you go for a 4D experience. When it rains in the movie, they make it drop water on you. When it's the wind in the movie, they turn the fans and give you wind. When you are riding up and down, your seats start shaking. It's called 4D experience. So the Prophet ﷺ said, there will be O2 and you will see your place in heaven. You will see your place in hell. And the angels will tell you, Allah was fair with you. He reserved for you a space here and a space here. And it was up to you to make the choice. And you made the right choice. So our Lord has commanded us to close the window of hell and to expand the window of heaven. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and when the wind blows in Jannah, it makes it to inside your grave. <sighs> ya Allah, whose house is that? And the angels will say, well, that's your house. Ya Allah, whose landscape is that? Oh, that's your landscape. Whose tree is that? That's your tree. That wind, where did it come from? It came from your spot. If this is mine, yes. Can I go to it? No. You have to wait. For what? For the day of judgment. Ya Allah, bring the day of judgment. Ya Allah, bring the day of judgment. Ya Allah, bring the day of judgment. Just like you wish death when you are dying. You're not scared. <sighs> A grave that is full of light. Very vast. You see your place in Jannah. You have company. And on the top of that, you have the company of the righteous people that are around you. You have a total social life. The Prophet made dua very profound. I did dua made. Why was that even possible? The Prophet said, Ya Allah, replace him with a home better than his home, a family better than his family, and neighbors better than his neighbors. Wow, that's a whole social life. I get a family and neighbors and a home? Yeah. Whoa, well, that's not scary. That's good. That's why, you know, I'm sometimes amazed. Some of the speakers, with a good intention, because they want Muslims to become better Muslims, they scare them with the hadith that is meant for the non-believers and the criminals and the sinners and they don't explain to them the hadith that talks about the believers and at least be fair mention this and mention this so what happens to the believer you get to know all what happens to the criminals and non-believers and murderers and evil sinners you get to know and then you get to know what happens to them on the day of judgment and then you get to know what happens to them in hell and the case is made to you that whether you are a Muslim or not you might go that route whether you are a good believer or not you might go that route so what happens you give up you're like you know what I don't want to think about this but this is not how Allah explained things can we just stick to how Allah explained things and his messenger take everything I told you and flip it the angels of Allah describe those angels as their faces are dark and scary. People imagine angels all the time as cherubs and all of that. No. And when the person is dying, he's so evil, so criminal, so murderer, there has to be judgment. Allah said in the Quran, one of the proofs that there is day of judgment, Allah said, do you treat the criminals and the peaceful people the same way? No, you don't. You punish the criminals. You want me to make the criminals and the peaceful people the same? 
You want to say that there's no day of judgment after all of this injustice that takes place because of the human? I will bring justice. Do we make the Mujrimeen criminals like the Muslimin peaceful people? How do you make judgment? Do you judge like that in real life? So Allah says, if you don't judge that in real life, how do you expect me to do that? There has to be a day of judgment. Because criminals are not punished here. They have to be punished somewhere. So the Prophet says, Allah sends dark angels. Scary looking. And in the Quran, Allah says, and if you see when the angels of punishment are receiving the souls of the criminals, they are beating them on their faces and on their sides. You're actually getting a beating. Beating. As if Dying is not scary enough. As if seeing scary angels are, is not scary enough, you get a beating. Then the Prophet ﷺ described that his ruh, because he sees that, his ruh runs back into his body. And then the angel of death takes it out, like one of you puts a plant of thorns inside wet cotton and pulls it. Each thorn takes piece of that cotton with it. So his soul will come out in pieces. Why do you want to do that to yourself? Sometimes I think people don't love themselves and that's the problem. Because if you love yourself, you wouldn't do that to yourself. Why would you want to go that route? What's pushing you? What's forcing you? Nothing. People run away from Islam because I love myself. No, you hate yourself. <coughs> Really? You hate yourself. Who runs away from Allah? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. To Ash-Shaytan Ar-Rajim. Who, who does that? To what? To be called cool? Damn it. That's a damned action. Shaytan that is damned. Why do you want to be damned with it? With him? Why? The Prophet Sallallahu says they bring water from hell boiling they bring clothes from hell and the person sees and says who is this for they say this is for you and when is that going to happen when you die please ya Allah don't make me die but they let him die and he goes that beating and experience and then they go from heaven and he just say what a bad smell can you not come from here can you go from the other gate so you feel rejected Criminals feel rejected and they should. They should pay the price. They go up and Allah tells them, I gave you a chance, I reminded you, I sent for you messengers, I gave you guidance, I sent for you people to wake you up. You refuse. You wanted to be stubborn. You wanted to do what you do. So go back to it. Go back to where you came from and you have seen nothing yet. So it's the opposite experience. May Allah never make us experience that. So the person sits in that barzakh world, which could last millions of years, millions. We don't know how long is left in the life of planet Earth before the day of judgment. Hundreds of thousands, thousands, a hundred years, million years, millions of years. It does make a difference if you live in a place for a million years and you see your place in heaven. You don't feel time. You are in a state of joy just anticipating to go to the next better state. That's a good life. You want that. Who doesn't want that? I want that. You should want that. So that's the state of the barzakh, subhanAllah. Then Allah Azza wa Jal ends the world, the actual world outside. You're already dead. And that's why people keep on asking, when is the end of the world? Mata sa'a, mata sa'a. What, what difference does it make? The Prophet said, when you die, your qiyamah starts. 
Who cares if the world didn't end? You die. <laughs> you're done. <laughs> now your qiyama, your hisab has started. And that's why from the get-go, you get the nice clothes, good smell and good shower, and have a nice grave, or you're going to be in the opposite. Who cares? It's the end of the world. What year does it... And you know, you see people going crazy about that. The year 2000, people kill themselves. May 12, 2000, um, this one of the priests keep on telling Christians until they kill themselves on May 12 or something. 2017 or 16 or 15. And then he stayed alive and his congregation stayed alive. And he had the nerve to go back and teach. I don't get it. You're supposed to be dead, man. What are you doing here? Anyway, that's his choice. إِذَا مَاتَ بْنُ آدَمْ قَامَتْ قِيَامَتُهُ Your qiyamah is the day you die. So, but there will be the end of the world, and the end of the world, Allah will not let a believer witness it. And people go crazy. Signs of the day of the judgment. Okay. MashaAllah. Okay. The Mahdi has to come, and then, then, then the Dajjal has to come, and then Jesus has to come, and then Ya'juj and Ma'juj has to come. Oh, khalas. Yani they're going to come, you know, just wait a second. Yani they're coming. <laughs> Do you know when Tatar and Mongolians attacked the Muslim world? Do you know Muslim scholars at that time and the public were talking that those are Ya'juj and Ma'juj? And that was the end of the world? Because it was. Let me tell you just one piece of information. There was a Muslim kingdom called Khawarizm. Tashqand. Uh, it had Uzbekistan, part of Afghanistan in it. The Tatar came, downsized the population from 2 million to 200,000. 90% of people were slaughtered. That's just their breakfast before they entered the death of the Muslim world. <coughs> Without a Hiroshima and Nagasaki, how many people died? 250,000 people. Without a nuclear bomb. Without an airplane, without a missile, without a tank, without a gun, without a machine gun, without a rifle, without a bullet, Tatar killed a million people in one month in Baghdad. And some narration, two million. They killed so many people, didn't know how to count. That's the day of judgment. But it didn't come. So, Instead of yani, our deen energizing us, no, mashallah, Muslims are experts in making their deen destroy them. Their own deen destroy them. Yani, no need for enemies. With friends like those, who needs enemies? Mashallah, between Al Qaeda and ISIS and God knows who else, which king who supports which movements, who needs enemies? <coughs> But what are Muslims have downside? They went to the signs of the day. Everybody, oh, the Dajjal is coming. Huh? And this speaker becomes very famous because he's talking about the Dajjal. And all of people, like, why? Because you're talking about something else. You're not talking about you. He's not talking to you about you. He's not talking about you changing yourself. He's, talk, he's getting you lost in some nice, scary stories. Or it's a movie. But this movie might be true. And I might be witnessing it. If the Dajjal is coming soon, I really advise you change. <laughs> And get this, Sunnis are making fun of Shia. Shia are making fun of Sunni. That's the good news. We're killing each other. Sunnis are waiting for who? Al-Mahdi. Shia are waiting for who? Al-Mahdi. They're both waiting for the same guy. Meanwhile, can we just kill each other? We get nothing to do, so we might as well kill each other until Al-Mahdi comes. MashaAllah. It's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. Waiting for the same person, which we shouldn't wait. We should be doing our part. We should be like, no, we're not going to wait. If he comes, Ahlan wa sahlan, alhamdulillah, we are honored to see the great, great, great grandson of the Prophet. If he doesn't come, alhamdulillah, we are honored to serve Allah. Serving Allah and doing what is right is not waiting for a person. What kind of deen is this? The Prophet told you something might will happen at the end of time. You don't know if it's the end of time or not. So do your part. The whole world is doing their part, working together, improving their countries, building infrastructure, respecting the human. And in our countries, we kill the human for what? So that this person is called powerful, the best warlord, the best leader, the most one who killed his people, the richest. 
and the countries are destroyed. Wallahi, may Allah forgive us Amen. for what we have done to the image of Islam. Because this is not witnessing for Allah, this is witnessing against Allah. We are witnesses against Allah. And it's definitely plots, our enemies are plotting, but we are stupid for these plots to work on us. There's someone that plotting, make no mistake, I'm not in delusion. But why? Why nobody can plot about something with someone else except Muslims? No, the only one who plots against Muslims are Muslims. Yani the enemy of the, yani billahi, someone walks into a family, five brothers, five sisters, from the same mom and dad, grew up in the same house, exactly the same family. Someone walks in and gives ten gums and tells them, you know what, you should kill one another. They start killing one another. Now you're going to blame the one who gives them guns? He should give you a thousand guns and you will not kill your own brother and sister. So it is a plot, it is a conspiracy, but woe to us and shame to us that these conspiracies are working. Not working on anyone else except us. That's why you really have to change. Wallah, I see our hope. SubhanAllah, when we came from our respected countries, beloved countries, honorable countries, we came carrying a lot of baggage. We came for dunya. And here you are sitting learning about akhirah. Because Allah had a better plan for you than you had for yourself. We are the hope of the Muslim Ummah, as far as I can see it. We're not under oppression, we're not under land. We are the hope. Because imagine if we're living in Syria right now, Libya, Yemen, Egypt. It's crazy. You'll be in jail. That's the good news. You'll be in jail. You'll be dead. And you will see your own wife and son and daughter killed in front of you. So, after the Barzakh, you know, obviously you are in the Barzakh world. The end of the world takes place. And Allah this explains the end of the world. And Muslims, when they hear, read the ayat in the Quran, they don't know how to differentiate between the ayat that talks about the end of this world and the beginning of the new world. They mix between them. But that's a whole other thing. I don't want to get into that. I'm trying to benefit from this lecture. I don't, I'm not trying to make you go home with information, but rather with transformation. You want to go home and do it. Do, do it. Do your salah. Become part of the ummah. Join the ummah. Find a Muslim organization that stands up for mercy, justice, peace, that does something good in the name of Allah. Work with Muslims. Work with Muslims. Help one another. Stand together. That's the way to Jannah. So then the Day of Judgment happens. I told you 40... It rains for 40 until all humanity resurrects. And on that day, brothers and sisters, there is only one prime real estate location. And it's not the Bay Area. <laughs> it is to be under the throne of Allah when there is no shade or shadow except the shade of His throne. Because in the beginning of the resurrection, the sun, it seems, implodes and becomes very close to earth. So it becomes very hot, bottom line. And you are either in shade or you are not in shade. There's only one shade, and one is the shade of the throne of Allah. If you're not, the Prophet ﷺ prescribes some people swearing to their ankles, to their knees, to their waistline, to their shoulders, to their ears and some people drown in their own sweat because it's so hot and they're so scared. You know when it's cold room and you get scared and nervous, you start sweating in a cold room. Now imagine the combination of you're scared and it's hot. So people go through <coughs> the resurrection and people think that when they get resurrected, they get resurrected and then Allah judge them and then they go to heaven or hell. You would wish. They actually wait for 50,000 years, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, and the Prophet elaborated in the Hadith, فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةً 50,000 years, خمسين, 50, ألف, thousand, سنة, year. 
50,000 years and people are waiting just for Allah to start the judgment. And why the 50,000 years are going, Allah is recreating the world in front of everyone because they didn't witness how Allah created it the first time, but they will witness this time. So they know Allah is there. So Allah, people start shaking and shivering, and the earth is shaking and shivering. You know, we live in an earthquake, subhanAllah. May Allah save us, may Allah save us and our loved ones, inshaAllah. And if Allah decides to take us in an earthquake, may Allah consider it a shahada for us, inshaAllah. Make us shaheed, inshaAllah. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So, the good news about earthquakes is one of two things. Earthquakes are short. At the end of the earthquake, you will either be dead, so you've got nothing to worry about, you're not going to feel scared anymore, or the earthquake will stop and you're not going to feel scared anymore. Now imagine this combination. The earthquake is not stopping and you're not dying. It's not stopping. <laughs> it's shaking and volcanoes and everything is coming out. Whatever is making the earth heavy is coming out. Like the core of the earth, the iron core is coming out. And the human will say, what happened to earth? You know, you know when you get on a plane, you have only one wish. When can we land? Because earth is security for you. You know when you are in a boat or in the sea, you have one wish. When can we go back to the land? Because land is secure, steady, stable. Now imagine when the earth under your feet is not secure, steady, or stable, and it doesn't want to stop. And it seems in two, in two different surahs that Allah, you know, subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the earth will be hit and will be hit again. Al-Qari'a min Qari'a wa ma'adra. Yawma tarjufu al-Rajifa tatba'uha al-Rajifa. It's like two comets will hit, the first one, then the second one, but things will be shaking and shivering. And the people will be like, Ya Allah, please save us, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. But they are not, they are not asking for judgment. Because they know what comes after judgment is trouble. <coughs> so no one is asking for judgment. Because nobody knows what's going to happen after judgment. After 50,000 years, humanity gives up. And they go. And they start looking for anyone. Go to Adam. He's the first human being. Allah created him with his hands. Taught him of his knowledge. He's very close to Allah. Let's go, Ya Adam, you are our father, the first human. Can you please make dua to Allah that he will start the judgment? We've been waiting for a long time. Please, can you? And Adam salam says, I cannot. Allah told me not to eat from the tree, and I ate from the tree. I cannot. Go to Nuh. Nuh lived for a thousand years, made da'wah, he's honorable in the eyes of Allah. Ya Nuh, you made da'wah for 950 years, you were very close to Allah, Ya Nuh. Nuh says, Allah gave me one da'wah, Allah gives every messenger a da'wah, and he either uses it in dunya or in akhirah. All the messengers use their da'wah in dunya, except Prophet Muhammad. So he said, I used my da'wah in dunya, I made du'a against my people, and Allah answered my du'a, I cannot save you. Allah destroyed my people. But Ibrahim, Ya Ibrahim, Ya Ibrahim, Ibrahim says, and that today is not, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was alive, <laughs> what, we, what we call today, uh, um, uh, and, and almost the truth, it, to Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was alive. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, when the king in Egypt wanted to take his wife, he told his wife, there is no believers on planet earth except me and you. So if they ask you about me, say he's my brother because I'm your brother in faith. I'm, but don't tell them I'm your husband. Because if you tell them I'm your husband, the soldiers will kill me instantly. But if you say I'm your brother, they'll put me in jail. <coughs> so they came. Sarah was very beautiful, extremely beautiful. And the king was a woman molester. Any beautiful woman, he captures her and sleeps with her, rapes her. 
So Ibrahim, they said, who's this? She said, he's my brother. So they took him to jail and Sayyidina Ibrahim kept on making salah, salah, dua, dua. And she went to the king and the king, every time he tried to touch her, he froze. Tried to touch her, he froze. He said, can you make dua that, that uh, Allah will release me and I will not touch you? So she made dua, Allah released him, then he tried to attempt second time, third time. What, what this, Sayyidina Ibrahim will say, I have lied, I have a sin. I told my wife to say I'm her brother when I was her husband. When actually he didn't lie, she was his sister in Islam, like your wife is your sister in Islam. So I, I don't know, I can't imagine that. Imagine what we have said. Go to Musa, Ya Musa. Musa said, I've killed one of the pharaohs for no right, and I have, you know, done this and that, I, I'm sorry, go to Isa. Ya Isa, and here is where my heart bleeds for my Christian brothers and sisters, because the whole jest and premises of Christianity is that Jesus is our Savior, and He will talk to God on our behalf. Only if they know that when they run to Jesus in the day of judgment, He will not talk to God on their behalf. No, He is your sa their Savior. And He will tell them, you know, no one can talk to Allah today except this man. Go to Prophet Muhammad. So what they want from Jesus is actually in Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> and you feel sorry, man. Like I want the same, right? We don't worship Prophet Muhammad, he's not a God, he's not the son of God. But the gist of it, why they're calling him God and the son of God? So that he can intercede on their behalf. He died for our sins. So the idea is intercession, shafa'ah. Tab al-shafi'ah wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why are you wasting your time? Sayyidina Isa is above our heads and in our hearts, but he's not a shafi'ah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does two shafa'ah. The Prophet ﷺ, humanity comes at his feet. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Ana Ahmad, wa ana Hamid, wa ana al Hashir, wa ana al Aqib. Yuhshaw al Nasu ala qadamayin. I'm one of my names is Al Hashir, which means people will, on the day of Hashir, on the day of crowds, they will come and crowd at my feet and beg that I will make dua. So I get up. And I go and I make sajda between the hands of Allah and Allah inspires me to say certain hamd and thana and make a certain dua that I don't know now but my Lord will teach me on that day and I make that and my Lord will say raise up your head and ask and I shall give you. Each prophet and messenger used to say to the humani to humanity Allah today is angry like he was never before and will not be after. So don't ask me to talk to Allah today. So the Prophet ﷺ make dua, make hamd, make thana. And Allah tells him, he said, Ya Allah, your creation has been waiting for a long time. Start the judgment and have mercy on them. Allah said, and your call is answered. He says, Ya Allah, I have another request. He says, and you shall ask. And he says, Ya Allah, I know I am the last messenger. And I know my ummah is the last ummah. But can I ask you to judge them first? And Allah says, and you shall be granted that too. So the Prophet wasallam says, some of my ummah will be in heaven for hundreds of years, while the rest are still getting judged outside. Privilege, privilege, honor. Today people come up with some, I don't know what kind of ideas. They want to take Prophet Muhammad out of this. Don't talk about Prophet Muhammad. He's, he's just delivered the message. I just follow the Quran. I don't follow the Sunnah. I don't follow the Hadith. I don't believe in the Hadith. I just, the Prophet Allah sent him to deliver the Quran. MashaAllah. To deliver the Quran so that you can make tafsir to it. Not the Prophet. Those people, they have no one other than Allah on the day of judgment and the power of shafa'ah that he gave to his messenger. No one. And they spend their lifetime, oh, we don't believe in the hadith. There is hadith da'if and there is hadith sahih. And, but in the Quran, it's all sahih and it's all authentic. And, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. 
Let's apply your method on medicine. There is a good medicine, and there is a bad medicine. They used to give people aspirin. Headache aspirin. Pain aspirin. Then they thought, oh, 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 it's blood thinner. Okay. Well, I sure, what, what is this? Medicine, you give me blood thinner and I, I don't want to take medicine ever for the rest of my life. Do you do that with medicine? Allah sent us doctors in the early ages of Islam that collected the hadith and told us this is hadith not fabricated, this is weak because of this and this, and this is strong, and in the strong there is plenty of benefit. And if you want to follow the body, follow the, the, the weak, but know where is its weakness and know where to use it and when not to use it. Very simple. Allah sent us doctors that told us this is good medicine and this is keep away from it. You come and say, I don't want to take medicine at all. Just like when I was about to start my six months of chemotherapy. May Allah reward some brothers and some sisters out of love. Sheikh, please don't take chemotherapy. I said, what shall I take? What, what am I going to French fries? What am I going to take? I need to take a medicine. Please give me a medicine. Sheikh, you can homopathic and this and this and that. I say, okay. Can you please have some aqil? I'm going to take the black seed. I'm going to take honey every day. I'm going to drink ginger every day. I'm going to take turmeric every day. But Allah, the Messenger of Allah said, Allah did not reveal a sickness, but He revealed what? Cure. And He cured with it. And whosoever knows it, knows it. The Hodgkin lymphoma, for 40 years, they've been treating it like a clock. It's the only cancer in textbook that has a cure, not a treatment. What do you want me? I said, okay, I will follow your love and your care. Give me the number of this guy whom I have to talk to and ask for medicine. So I called the guy. Take the guy with him. Hello, sir. Hi, how are you? This and this. I said, I just have a straightforward question for you. Have you ever treated someone with Hodgkin lymphoma? When I went to medical school, he started in information for me. Right? When I went to medical school, there was a guy that came and he had stage 4 brain cancer. And my teacher, they have given up on him. They didn't give him a therapy. He gave him therapy and he healed him. I said, you didn't answer my question. Have you treated? Can you tell me? I have 10 cases of Hodgkin lymphoma treated through my method. And show me and let me call them. No, actually, and this is when I fell on the floor laughing. Because he was honest. And then he caught himself that he was a... No, I actually had a patient. She was taking chemotherapy. No, she, she was diagnosed with lymphoma. It was non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And they told her, take a medicine. She didn't. She came to me. I treated her for three months. But then it spread all over the place. And she, she did not went with me to the end of the treatment. So she went back. And they told her, you came back too late. And then she died. <laughs> did you just say that? <laughs> Like medicine, take medicine. So, subhanAllah, the Prophet وسلم, don't let people with, you know, with some ignorance that you don't follow the hadith and not follow the sunnah. Yeah, I mean, you know what you're doing to yourself? You're the only card you have on the day of judgment, you've just thrown it away. Yeah, Bismillah, go. Go to your judgment without the shafa'ah of the Prophet وسلم, and see. The Prophet وسلم, you know when I told you people wait for 50,000 years? The Prophet has a basin, a lake for him. Water comes from Jannah, from Nahr al-Kawthar, ends in this lake. People are thirsty to death on that day. The Ummah of the Prophet وسلم, comes to him and Allah gives him the power to know. Hmm? So the Prophet وسلم, said this, this like pool, this lake, has cups hung on its edges. The number of the cups is like the number of the stars of the sky. Because the Ummah of Rabham is a large Ummah. So you have your cup with your name written on it. You take, you drink. And some people, the Prophet ﷺ give them the cup with his own hands. Come to you. And then some people come to drink from that cup and Allah pushes them. Angels come and push them away. But Rasulullah says, my Ummah, the Prophet says, you don't know what they have done after you. They've made inventions, and they didn't want to follow you, and they didn't want to believe, and they don't want to... So you understand what they do? So don't be from those who changed their religion and started making stuff up right and left. 
because you want to change Islam to fit you. You don't want to change you to fit Islam because you want to become a good Muslim but your own way and you don't want to transform and change. So you want to change Islam to fit you and you kill it when you do that and with it you kill yourself. And it doesn't work. The Prophet ﷺ says once someone drink from that cup he will never ever, she will never ever experience her thirst ever after that. It's like a, the preview tickets for Jannah. Khalas, no thirst for you. Ya'ni, no Jahannam for you. <sighs> Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ give that cup and his ummah drinks. And then... Um, the Prophet talks about the Lash and talks about the shade and then talks about something for you and I to aspire to. He said there are people who are not prophets, messengers, shuhada or salihin. But the prophets and messengers and shuhada and salihin envy them on the day of judgment. They sit on seats, member made of light and they face each other and they sit having a good time during the sight of the day of judgment when everyone is going through a hard time. Ya Rasulullah, who are they? The prophets and messengers and suhada and shuhada and salihin envy them? Yes. Who are they? Those who loved one another for the sake of Allah. People don't know that one anymore. Today, uh, people will befriend the people whom they call we click. We have chemistry, some biology and mathematics and physics too. We have chemistry, which I don't understand chemistry. You are a human being. What chemistry? We're not talking about H2O, we're talking about you. Human feelings, mind, intellect, heart. So if you make me laugh, we're friends. If you don't interfere in my business, we're friends. We like each other. A few personalities like my personality, and you like laughing and this and going out and in and movies and it. We, we, if you know, but but if you want to get in my business and you want to start, you know, advising me and you, no, I don't want you. That's not your sister in Islam. That's your friend. It could be anyone. Who's your sister? The one that if she sees you going wrong, she will talk. Nicely, with adab, with respect, but she will talk, she will not remain silent. He will tell you, and you shall be very happy that someone told you there's something wrong with you. You shall kiss them on the forehead and say, thank you, Jazakallahu khairan. Like Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab used to say, may Allah reward someone who gifted me my faults. You gifted me, oh, thank you, now I know what to work on. So today what we want, we want just friends and fun and this. Sometimes your sister in Islam or your brother in Islam, sometimes you click. It, it comes. It's going to come anyway. Friendship comes. But sometimes you don't click. But you still love them. Because you know they are a good Muslim at heart. But some way, somehow their personality does not soothe your personality. Today they made us so self-centered, so selfish, so cornered, so zoned out, so in our world. That if anybody says anything remotely criticizing our holiness, we become bothered. And we don't want to talk to them anymore. Why they're so rude? Why do they get in my business? You want someone to get in your business. And save you. And wake you up. And warn you. Come on, people. This is the people that prophets and messengers and shuhada, martyrs and salihin will envy them on the day of judgment because they didn't build friendships based on who do I click with. You can click with anyone and everything. You can bring a cat and click with him. <laughs> if you want someone not to answer you, you can bring a dog. But a human, you want someone to, you can want someone to talk to you, to tell you. The Prophet ﷺ said the believer is the mirror of the believer. Do you look in the mirror when you wake up in the morning? Do you look beautiful as if you are already ready? No, the mirror reflects exactly. Subhanallah. In the books of Sirah, it tells us 
Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and Sayyidina Omar were two different personalities. They were opposite personalities. They used to get on the nerves of each other all the time. But they loved each other more than anything else. We don't know how to do that because we're not mature. Like we, They made us babies. We get hurt very easily. We get intimidated very easily. We are so emotionally immature. Anybody says anything, and you erupt like a volcano of nafs and pride and arrogance. How, how are you going to make it to Jannah like that? That's what got shaitan in trouble. He erupted, he exploded. Like, why should I make that sujood? Why he's better than me? Shh. Allah, Allah said something, go with it. Do first, ask questions later. People come and ask me a question. Sheikh, on, you know, why did Allah... Uh, uh, make uh, pork haram? Very good question to ask Allah in Jannah. <laughs> Just make it to Jannah and then ask God what you want. Just secure. Okay. Why did you make pork haram? Make it to Jannah first. What, you, you're going to eat pork now because you don't know why it's haram? Subhanallah. So that's why the Prophet وسلم, said, so Allah starts the hisab, Allah starts the judgment, and Allah starts judging people. And when Allah judges people, He judges them in two rounds. The first round, Allah brings the case for them or against them. So judgment, when it comes to judgment, two groups. The Prophet وسلم, said, the believers that are meant to go to Jannah, Allah does not question them about details. Allah talks about them in general, about their life, in general. But no questioning in details. The Prophet ﷺ said, whosoever Allah questions him about details, he will be in trouble. No, no questioning about details. And that's the beauty. That's another payoff of being a believer. That's what you get for being part of that club. You don't get questions about details. Allah tells you, good job, but you could have done better. You feel embarrassed, you feel, move, move. Right? But why did you do this? Why this detail? Why that detail? Why did you, now you, you are up for trouble. God knows where you're going to end up after that. Allah might forgive you or Allah might make you go through hell. Allah, Allah knows best. So that's why the believers go through arq, not hisab. Arab means just exposing, Allah exposes them to them, speaks to them individually, but then, you know, they move on. The Prophet ﷺ said that people will be judged and then the kafir and the munafiq, when Allah brings the case against them, will say, Ya Allah, I didn't do that. They will try to get away with it. Maybe I can lie and get away with it. Maybe I can get away. So Allah gives you fair trial. This is the case against you, one, two, three, four. So the person says, I didn't do that. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, fine. Okay, then we're gonna, we have to bring the witnesses. So now the witnesses come in the second round of judgment. The second round of judgment before it starts. The first round people will deny, reject, say that didn't happen, please Ya Allah, I never said. SubhanAllah, Allah asks Prophet Nuh, every Prophet, did you convey the message to your people? So Sayyidina Nuh said, Ya Allah, 950 years. Allah asked the people of Nuh, did Nuh convey the message to you? They say, La, Ya Allah, Wallahi, he didn't. By you, he didn't. So Allah says, in a proceeding of the court, Ya Nuh, do you have witnesses? And Nuh says, yes, Ya Allah, I do. Allah says, who? He said, the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad are my witnesses. Read Surah Nuh and be ready. Inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmi an andir qawmaka min qabli ayyatiyahum adabun alim. Read it and be ready to witness for Sayyidina Nuh. It's a fair and square court proceedings. So Allah Azza wa Jal, in the second one, now the first one, people have went through the hisab. Hmm? Some people Ard, some people Hisab. The one who went through Ard has nothing to argue about. He made it, right? And the one who went through Hisab, he's denying and doing yes and no, yes and no and this. And that's why we have to judge ourselves before Allah judges us. So then Allah Azza wa orders 
the books of your records, your entire life story that were written by both angels to be given. So they fly the records. The people, the believers, subhanAllah, Allah gave them power in their right hand and they take the book in their right hand and they get excited. They say, come, come, read my book. I knew that there is a day of judgment. I prepared myself. Oh my God, look, 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 look at my book. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَيَقُولُ هَا أُمُقْرَأُ كِتَابِيَ Come and read my kitab. إِنِّي ظَنَنْتُ أَنِّي مُلَاقٍ حِسَابِيَ I knew, I thought that they will be a judgment. I prepared myself for this day. فَهُوَ فِي عِشَةٍ رَضِيَ فِي جَنَّةٍ عَالِيَةٍ خلاص. You're in Isha. Good life. High heaven. Go. Allah gives them their book with their left hand behind their back. Fayaqul, he says, Ya laytani lam uta kitabiya. I wish I was not given my book. Walam adrima hisabiya. I wish I was never resurrected and went through this. Ya laytaha kanatil qadiya. I wish I died and never was resurrected. هَلَكَ عَنِّي مَالِيَ My money is gone. Sultania, my sultan is gone. That's why, brothers and sisters, we don't run from learning about the Day of Judgment for life. We run to it. We don't run away from it. Because the more you're acquainted with it, the more you're ready with it. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? You know that journey? of the person going up in heaven and coming back to the grave and the two angels coming and asking, the Prophet ﷺ says, when the criminal, the kafir, the criminal, the evil, the one who did a lot of injustice, right, when he comes back, he's already, he's in a state of shock. He never thought about angels. He never thought about life after death. He never thought about angels. He never thought about Allah. He never thought about ruh. He never thought about heaven and hell. He never thought about hisab. So the Prophet ﷺ says the angels will be asking him and saying, Man ilahuk? Who's your Lord? And he will say, the Prophet literally said this, Ah, ah, like this, ah, alif, ha, alif, ah, ah. He, he can't answer, he can't focus. Angels, spirits, souls, jinn, heaven, God, skies, levels, punishment, I'm not ready for this. I didn't, I don't know anything about, he's in a state of shock, right? And the believer is, just came from a delegation and they're asking, who's your Lord? My Lord is Allah. He's ready. He's looking at these angels who are smiling at him and he's smiling back. The Prophet ﷺ said about Sayyidina Umar, the angels come and ask him, who's your Lord? He says, who's your Lord? <laughs> I know who's my Lord Allah. He's ready, he's not scared. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhu. You know? So the idea is, acquaint yourself. People read Quran in Ramadan, and I don't know what they're reading. Are you paying attention? Like, are you paying attention? Please, read a page in Arabic, then read the translation in front of it. Urdu, Persian, English, French, whatever you want. Just read that and let it get to your heart. You're not here in a race, oh, Allah, I read your book, but I assure you, I didn't understand anything. <laughs> Really? Is that why you want to answer Allah? Well, it's, it's a mind-boggling. I mean, come on, people. You don't have to be a Arab. Read the translation. But read a good translation. Yani, I hear of translations today that are coming out. Wallahi, my blood is boiling. My blood is boiling. What is this? People deny there is no jinn. There is no arwah. The moon never split for the Prophet wasallam. And when in the translation, scientifically, academically, when the ayah says something, if the tafsir of the ayah in your head is different, you translate it exactly from Arabic to English, then in the footnote you write and the meaning of that, but you don't insert. Today people insert the tafsir in the ayah, in the translation. You know they do that in, in a college, they kick them out from being a professor for life because it's called fraudulent. You're committing a fraud. You mistranslate intentionally. 
So people are so scared. Oh, then the Muslims are going to read the Quran and they're not going to become Muslim and they're going to hate us and they're not going to have a comfortable life. Let's change the Quran. I have a copy of the Quran right now in, 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 in my cup. And I'm going to ask the administration of every masjid not to let, not to distribute these copies. By Allah, the Quran is getting changed from our community in front of our eyes. What is this? All for the kuffar, I mean? What is, they are your God, they're going to make hisab for you? Yeah, akhi, translate it as Allah put it, then put the explanation, fine. But there is a mana, there is a scientific, academic amana. If it says something in Arabic, don't change it to something else in the core of the translation. Put footnotes, put explanation. That's why, brothers and sisters, I want you yani, to, may Allah guide us to that which is best, and may Allah inspire us. But you see, then Allah sends the books, and the person says, and he says, I wish, and then Allah Azza wa says, Iqra' kitabak, read your book, kafa bi nafsika liyawma alayka hasiba. It's enough that you judge yourself, you don't need me to judge you. So the person starts turning, and Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, the mujribeen, the criminals, they say, Huh? Why this book does not leave a small thing or a big thing, but here, why, why, why the small things? We can't get away with anything. Whatever they have done, they found it in front of them. And your Lord will not oppress anyone. This is your deeds. Read your own deeds, your own book. It's enough that you judge yourself today. That's what Allah tells the person. And then the person says, but Ya Allah, this and this. Allah said, okay, you're still denying? Okay, still denying. Allah orders the mouth of the kafir shut. And Allah orders the hands and the feet to talk. Talk. So the hands start talking. And then the person looks. And then Allah opens his mouth and says, Woe to you, why have you witnessed against me? I was just trying to save you from hell. Why did you witness against me? And your own hand and skin will say, the one who make anything speak, the one who make who made anything speak, made me speak. I had no control. I had to testify to what you have done with your hands, with your ears, with your eyes, with your mouth, what you have done with your feet, where did you walk to? I had to speak. So Allah says, Huh, the case is made or not? You have the book of record, and now, and then Allah brings the angels who used to write, witness. And then Allah brings other human beings to witness that you harm them and hurt them. Allah brings them to witness. And Allah brings and then the trees, the rocks, the land that you were taught standing on, and it will witness for you or against you. That's why when we're done with Salat al Fard, we move a little bit and we pray sunnah in a different spot. Because every spot you pray in, it will witness for you on the Day of Judgment. So you increase the number of spots. The Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you is traveling in the wilderness, and the time of Salah comes, let him make a loud adhan for no tree or rock that hurts him, but will witness for him on the Day of Judgment. Ya Salam. Ya Salam. The trees are witnessing for you. Yeah, Allah, if I wear you, you know when you go to school, go under every tree. Say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa la akbar. Did you hear that? <laughs> okay, next tree. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa la akbar. Because that tree hears you. That bird hears you. That rock that you're sitting on hears you. Subhanallah, make things witness for you. That's why I tell you, if you need to get busy. You need to get busy going out and doing some good deeds. Get excited. There's nothing more exciting than this. What do you want? What's the wish of any other, any human? I want to live forever, young, beautiful, healthy, no financial problems, no problems whatsoever from any other human being. I want to live forever. And Allah says, your wish is granted. That's why I created Jannah. That's why Allah considered this in the Quran one of the proofs that Jannah and Jahannam exist. Because every human wishes for it. There's no human that doesn't wish this wish. 
and wants to apply it in this life. So, in the world of logic, they say this is deductive. So, can I get hungry and there is no food, such thing as called food in the world? Is it possible? If there's no such a thing called food in the world, then I wouldn't get hungry. Can I get thirsty and there's no such a thing as water or anything that quenches your thirst? You wouldn't get thirsty. Can I wish for Jannah and Jannah doesn't exist? It doesn't happen. It does exist. The fact that you wish it is actually the proof that it exists. Look how the Quran was like. Unbelievable. Right? Crazy. Every human wishes for it. You know, subhanAllah. So, the people go through the second judgment. And once the judgment done, is done, darkness falls onto the world. And the sun goes from light to what we call dead dwarf star. The star's light will go off. The sun light will go off. And it will be nothing but a total darkness. Before this incident, I'm trying to rush, so forgive me if I forget something, I will try to remember. Before the incident of the darkness, Allah Azza wa Jal, as part of, you know when I told you Allah gives you the book and makes you make the skin of the Kafir witness and then the good things witness for you or the bad things witness for you? The final stage of judgment is Al-Mizan, so that just to make the case. So Allah puts your good deeds and your bad deeds in the Mizan. And you want your good deeds to be more than your bad deeds. You know how nice is Allah? Like how Rahman, Rahim, Kareem is Allah. This is mind-boggling. What does it take for you to go to hell? Very hard, very difficult to go to hell. Why? Because for every one good deed, you have to do 11 bad deeds. Because for every one de good deed, Allah gives you 10. For you to go to hell as a Muslim, for every one good deed, you have to do 11. So that then your bad deeds are worse than your good deeds. How nice is this? How easy is this? Allah just wants you to try. Just get in. Get your feet wet. Move. And then you give one dollar sadaqah, one dinar, one dirham, 700 minimum. Yani for every one dollar sadaqah, you have to do 701 bad deeds. That's why people think and Allah is just there to get people, put him in hell. La, 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 la. It's very hard to go to hell. <laughs> but some people, it's very easy for them. They live their life, bad deed after another, after another. When it comes to good deed, they run out of energy. Bad deed, they are energetic. Ajib. So after the mizan, the darkness fall, and subhanAllah, the people under the shadow of the throne of Allah, they'll be in, enlightened. And the people who might not made it into the shadow of Allah, but they made it through the ard and hisab, they glow in the dark. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, how would you know us on the day of judgment when the darkness falls? How do you know who's your ummah, if not who, not your ummah? He said, I will know. Because the parts where you make wudu will be glowing in the dark. So that's the barakah of your wudu. Subhanallah. So when you make wudu, take your time. This is light. And go above the ankle and go above here. The, the elbow and the ankle and go above, you know. And do your ears, all of it from inside. And you need that. Allah Azza wa says the believers, their light is in front of them and on their right. Yani, you know when you want to go, you know, there's a light and there's another light that you want to see, you know, move right and left. So your right hand will become a tool of light and in front of you, your face, because you make wudu, look, inside your mouth, inside your nose, your face, your head, and your ears. They will be all lighting up. So where is the light going? In front of you. So that's where you want it. Wabi aymanihim. And on their right hands. Subhanallah. So, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then, at this point, the hypocrites, 
They say, okay, we were from the Ummah of the Prophet we can make it. Um, so they run with the believers, and then they notice the believers have light, and they don't have light. So they say, can you give us from your light? Please, like, you got so much light, can you like, do like this, and then like, this? yeah, give me some of that light. And Allah, angels call upon them and say, step back, you shall get something. Step back, look for your light. SubhanAllah, what's the munafiq? The munafiq, the, the hypocrite, in the essence, when it came to Islam and he found it hard, he stepped back. So his entire life, the hypocrite, is all about what? Stepping back. So Allah says, your whole life was stepping back. Okay, step back. You want light? Step back. So they step back. Allah puts a wall between the believers and the unbelievers. This side is Ada, This side is Rahmah. فَقِيلَ ارْجِعُوا وَرَاءَكُمْ وَرَاءَكُمْ فَالْتَمِسُوا نُوَا فَضُرِبَ بَيْنَهُ بِسُورٍ لَهُ بَا ظَاهِرُهُ مَنْ قِبَلِ الرَّحْمَةِ ظَاهِرُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَبَاطِنُهُ مَنْ قِبَلِ الْعَذَابِ So the idea is from one side it will be عذاب, one punishment, one side it will be رحمة and then the believers march with their Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and Prophet and Messenger towards Jannah <coughs> Here is an issue. Because it's darkness on the other side, people will be running away from each other in the darkness, not seeing where they go. And as they run, they find themselves falling into hell. And the believers, guided by the light that Allah gives them, see where is the location of the Sirat. So they go to the Sirat to go to Jannah. To see the Sirat in itself is ni'mah. Because you wouldn't even see the Sirat if you're not from this group. You'll be running in darkness until you fall into your face in hell. May Allah never make us experience that. Ever, ever, ever. Amen. May Allah make us reach Ramadan. And make us witness Laylatul Qadr. And make us from those who have you decided in your ultimate hidden knowledge that they will never go to Jahannam, Ya Rabbi al They'll be your guests in Jannah, Ya Rabbi So they go to Asirat, and some people go like lightning, some people go fast, some people go slow, some people are Muslims, huh? Muslims, huh? They're going to they go to Jannah. But subhanAllah, that's why when Allah purify you in dunya, make you go through sickness or hardship, Thank Allah. Because Allah purifies the believer in dunya with bala. If it's not enough, Allah will purify him in his grave. If it's not enough, Allah will purify him with the horrors of the day of judgment. If it's not enough, Allah will purify him in hell. That's the last resort. You shouldn't go there. You shouldn't be in anywhere, any one of these. Let Allah purify you in dunya and thank Allah. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said when people look at the Muslims who are from Ahlul Bala, from the people that Allah tested them in dunya, they start wishing, why Ya Allah, you didn't make us from Ahlul Bala? Ya Allah, why didn't you give us a hard time in dunya? Look, these people got a hard time in dunya, now they have a hard time in uh, an easy time in Akhirah. Mm. SubhanAllah. And today you're saying, Ya Allah, why did you give me a hard time? <laughs> Tomorrow you'll be saying, why Ya Allah, you didn't give me a hard time? So that's why, brothers and sisters, this is very, very important to see things with a positive lens. Positive. Everything happens is positive. Khalas, let Allah purify it. Allah the, does whatever He does, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there's a contract between you and Allah. The contract, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Allah says, I'm going to make you live a good life, have a good grave, have a good day of judgment, and go to Jannah. But I'm going to do what it takes to go make you go through that. Now this is what you have to go through. No, 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 I don't wonder why did this happen? Yeah, you just trusted me, right? I'm gonna have to do. You trusted me. This is what you need, man. You need this problem so that you can get out of your arrogance. You need some humbleness. You need to be humbled. You need you need the money to go away from you because it blinded you. What can I do? But I love you, so I took the money away from you. You were so healthy, I took the health away from you. You were so famous. I defamed you. You were so up, I put you down. La hawla wa la quwwata, this is bad, Allah hates me. La, no, 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 no. Allah doesn't hate you. Allah is fulfilling his trust. He's making you 
go through what you need to go through so that you can make it to Jannah. In Surah Al-Imran, Allah says, قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ Say Allah who owns everything, who owns ownership itself. تُؤْتِي الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ You give kingdom, power, authority to whomever you want, and you take kingdom, power, and authority from whoever you want. وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ And you put up, give izzah to whoever, and you humiliate whosoever. Then Allah at the end said, وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُذِلُ مَنْ تَشَاءُ And at the end Allah said, بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرُ All of this is khayr. Allah makes you part strong, khayr. Takes power from you, khayr. Makes you rich, khayr. Humiliates you, make you poor, khayr. Why? Because He making you go through what you need to go through, so you have a fantastic life, grave, day of judgment, and go to Jannah. You're looking where? You're looking here. Today, tomorrow, Allah is seeing the whole infinity line. Because you're not going to die in Jannah. Where are your calculation? Today and tomorrow. Where is Allah's calculation? Infinity. You trust Him or you don't? If you trust Him, go with it. Be thankful. Anyway, go ahead, freak out. How is that going to change the situation? Okay, go ahead, freak out. Yeah, Bismillah. Yeah. Freak out. Don't have sabr. You know what? Don't have sabr. Sabr is not good for you. Yeah, how does that change? It doesn't change. It makes things worse. Now you're stressed and depressed. <laughs> Allah says that in the Quran. You think this is me? Allah says what? You don't like what I'm doing to you? D dig a hole in earth and go down? Or climb a, 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 a ladder in the sky and run to another universe? Ha, you don't like what I'm doing to you? Run away. Yeah, go. Where, where are you going to go? Uh, this is an ayah in the Quran. That's why. Make peace with it. Live in peace, man. Make peace with it. What is going to happen to you? The worst that's going to happen to you will happen to you, which is death. And that's not the worst for the believer. That's the best thing. I mean, what's someone going to do to you? What's going to happen to you? Lose your money? That's not the worst. Lose your health? That's not the worst. But the worst thing is going to happen. Lose your life. And you're going to lose your life. Everyone has yaqeen in that. Muslim and Catholic. So what's your problem? People live, oh, I'm scared, I'm afraid. That's why, subhanAllah, Islam is liberty. You're not scared anymore. You're not slave anymore. We came to take people out of being slaves and worshipping other people to being slaves and worshipping Allah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That's what the Sahabi said to Dustum, the leader of the Persian army. Why did you come here? We came to take people from the worshipping other people and the slavery of worshipping other people to worshipping Allah and from the hardship of dunya to the ease of dunya and akhirah. Philosophy. Message clear. Summarize Islam. We came to take people from the hardship of dunya وَمِنْ ضِيْقِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَىٰ سِعَةِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ We make people relaxed in dunya and in akhirah because they got nothing to fear. So next time you get hit with something and you're about to freak out, just talk to yourself like, what? Well, okay, I freak out and then Nothing is going to happen. So let me have it with him. Ya Allah, help me. Whatever Allah wants to do to this body, let him do to this body. That's his business. Anyway, this body will be given to you and will be taken away from you. And it will be decomposed. And when it decomposes, believe me, you're not going to care about it. You're going to be okay. I'm glad you're gone. So I can have enough space in my grave now. <laughs> Literally. And you spend your whole life trying to wash and shave your body and put the soup and that, and it still smells like dirt, subhanAllah. Anything comes out of you is disgusting. Sweat, boogers, what if everything comes out of you is disgusting? Because you're dirt. That's what comes out of you is dirt. And people want to compete on whose dirt is more beautiful than the other dirt. Wallahi, that's, that's, that's a waste of time, waste of energy. That's a waste of life, man. That's a waste of life. You are meant for something bigger and better. So, they pass the Sirat, the believers. But then there is something very interesting. And that's why I tell you, find a group of learning. Where is your Quran halaqa? Where is your transformation halaqa? Where is your Islam, Iman, Ihsan halaqa? Be with the Muslims. Because here is something for you that you have never heard. No one enters Jannah as an individual. You only enter Jannah with a Jannah. Then once you enter inside, you get your individual spot. Read Surah Al-Zumah. 
وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا The people who go to Jannah, they go groups. Even the one that, like he didn't have a group, Ya Allah, I was in the Eskimo, there was no other Muslims. Allah assigns for him a jama'ah on the day of judgment and tells him, enter with his jama'ah. يَا يَتُهَا النَّفْسُ الْمُطْمَئِنَّةِ اِرْجِعِ إِلَى رَبِّكِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيَةً لِشْ؟ Why didn't Allah say فَدْخُلِي جَنَّةِ No, first فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي Enter the group, then you enter Jannah. So if you are not with a group, if you are not learning, if you are not, يعني inshallah as I am coming out of this sickness, inshallah, not this coming Monday, following Monday is my surgery, inshallah, I'm doing a small surgery. Because it was a double hit, but Allah twice saved me. The first one was Hodgkin lymphoma, the second one was thyroid cancer. So they're going to remove the right thyroid, inshallah, and then we go back to learning. So inshallah, I look forward. If any one of you wants to learn, I'm your servant, you know. I don't. I believe in suhbat, because that's the model of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I'm not interested here to become your sheikh and on the top of your head, and you, you know, massage my feet and kiss my hand and bow down. I don't like that. I don't want that. We want to learn Islam together. The Prophet ﷺ was the best teacher. His Sahaba were the best student. Yet, they were not referred to as the teacher and his students. Today, everyone wants to have my students, my followers, my students. But are you better than Rasulullah? Rasulullah had companions, friends. And that was good enough. Because through companionship and friendship, people change. But through dumping knowledge, that has no relevancy to the world and to the daily life and no mirrors, no one giving you feedback and you're giving them feedback and they're giving you and you're giving them nasiha and they're giving you nasiha. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Plural, you have to believe together. You have to learn your deen to become mu'min. Together. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And they do good deeds. Plural. Together. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ they advised each other. Stick to the truth, man. Can you change this about you, sister? But don't get, don't get your feelings hurt. I say this because I really care about you. If you have anything to say to me, please teach me. Tell me, Sheikh, don't say that. Because many times, you know, we grew up in the Arab world. I had no interaction with women whatsoever. So when I started teaching sisters in America, I was very harsh. And I was like very, I didn't know how to talk to women, basically. So sister said, Sheikh, can you not say that? I said, Wallahi, Jazakillah khair. Do you know that that sister is her feelings are hurt? Wallahi, I didn't mean it. I didn't, I didn't know. No, you said it. And you know, when you translate Arabic to English, <laughs> you know, and then you're teaching and you're saying something in Arabic, but you're saying it in English, you know, you're talking uh, Arabizi, you know, you know, not Arabic or Inglesi, but Arabizi. So your the expressions comes harsh. And I didn't know the culture, and I didn't know what, what you should be sensitive. May Allah reward them, the people who were around me, that were my friends and companions. Uh, they've taught me a lot. They fixed my accent, they fixed my expressions, they fixed my spelling, they fixed my pronunciation. I, I wouldn't have been able to speak like this fluently if it wasn't for the feedback of the people. Did it hurt my feelings? No. You know, when I came to America, I used to say, I bear witness that there is no God but one God. <laughs> so someone, because I read it, it was bear. But then bear is the bear in the in the forest, right? So I said, that I don't want to be insulting to the name of Allah. So I said, I bear witness that there is no God but one Allah. I said, Shaykh, there's no bear. <laughs> and I didn't get that I'm saying bear, right? I'm running, as in Arabic, they say, you ran away from a... Uh, from a, a rodent, from a mice, you fill in a pig. So I ran away from bear, feeling it's disrespectful. I ended up with a beer, right? Which is worse, right? So uh, someone said, Sheikh, don't say beer, say bear. I bear. I said, but that's the animal. He said, no, no, it sounds the same, but that's the way. I said, wow, I've been saying that for six months. That's so embarrassing. <laughs> Why didn't you say it this? He said, now I got to know you and I can talk to you as a friend. You see the blessing of friendship? But when there's a distance and the teacher makes a mistake and nobody gives him a feedback, that's a problem. And when you give me a feedback, I might give you a feedback on your feedback. Yes, Sheikh, you say this is wrong. No, actually, it's right. So you bring your proof. I bring my proof. Now we end up with a discussion. This discussion is called dirasa in Arabic. And Allah praised the believers in the Quran that they are yadrusun. They give feedback and they have a discussion. 
But this whole idea that the Sheikh and Mawlana is the untouchable, unreachable, always busy. I don't know busy doing what. <laughs> like, what are you busy doing? You've read, you've read books. You can read two, three hours a day. Right? So what are you busy doing what? But, 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 but because I'm telling you, this job that Allah gave certain people, it comes not only with privileges, but it comes with responsibilities. You know the Prophet Wasallam, where was his house? <clears throat> right next to the masjid. Rooms, rooms, his families were across from the masjid. You want Rasulullah, you go to the masjid, he's right there. Accessible. Sayyidina Dawood used to close the doors once a week, one day a week, and not talk to people just for worship. Allah wanted to teach him a lesson. He made two people run over this and come to him and he gave the wrong judgment. And he said, Astaghfirullah. Allah said, okay, don't close the door. So I don't know. Today, scholars are better than the Prophet The Prophet was more accessible in Medina than our scholars today. You, you're busy doing what? Aren't you supposed to be fixing? As the Arab poet said, Oh, ulama, you are the milh. You are the salt of the balad. You know what we use salt? For preservation. How do you pickle things? With salt. You preserve it from going rotten and from rottening, right? So he said in the shir, oh ulama, you are the salt of the people. What are the people gonna do, gonna do if the salt goes rotten? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, where the people are gonna run out? They run from an ignorant to an ignorant. And when the scholar comes, he comes from one door and leaves from another door. And you have to kiss his hand and kiss his head and he has to disappear after that because he is busy. Busy doing what? This is the work of the Anbiya and Mursaleen. Be suhba. Rasulullah wa sahabatuhu. So you either sahabi, male, or sahabiya, female. <laughs> and the ladies came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, ghalabaka alayna rijal. Men took over you. This is not fair. He said, what do you want? They said, khassas lana yawman. Give us one day. Khususi for us. Fakhassas lahunna yawman khamis. Thursday became the ladies' day in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Men are allowed in the masjid only for salah, and they have to get out. Friday next day, the ummah comes, the men and women, no problem. Thursday, ladies' day. You understand? People have to have access, they have to learn. So, inshallah, we all embark on a journey of transformation. Inshallah, inshallah I will be reachable to you as much as I can. And, and, you know, maybe I live in Santa Clara not here, but then I can come once a week, whatever, this and that, and we can sit down and talk, and you can ask me personal questions and general questions and how an advice, it doesn't have to be a question, it might be what, what, what can I do, maybe I know, maybe I don't know, but maybe I know someone, you know, people come to me, can you interpret the dream? I say, I'm not strong in that, but I know someone who's strong in interpreting dreams. Someone comes and asks me, I have this problem with, you know, inheritance and this. I said, I know the general rules, but I didn't specialize in it. There's this sheikh, I know him, he's very good. So, it doesn't have, to, I don't have to have every answer, we have resources. But there will be no transformation if there's no suhbah, no companionship and fellowship. That's the method of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, the believers, they enter Jannah in groups, but before they enter Jannah, sometimes there's two believers that have unfinished business. <laughs> so Allah says, ah, there is a rule in Jannah. People inside, they love one another. No one holds resentment against one another. Yeah, you have to finish your... With me, you have no problem. Between you and me, God's right fulfilled. People's right, you didn't take any right from anyone, so that's why you passed the judgment. The hardest thing on the Day of Judgment is you took the rights of the people. So you say, oh, Allah forgive me. Allah say, you didn't take my right, you took his right. If he forgives you, I forgive you. If he doesn't forgive you, I don't. So that's why, don't take anything from people. Don't oppress people, stay away from them. Allah, when it comes to personal sins, willing to forgive you like nothing. Just don't be consistent in the sin and don't insist on it. That's all. With the people, you are on your own. That's why the Prophet said, even the shaheed, the one who died as a martyr, if he owes someone money on the Day of Judgment, he will not be forgiven until the other person says, I forgive you for the money you borrowed from me and you didn't pay off. 
You understand? So don't don't mess with people. Don't take their rights, but be there for them. Advise them. Let them advise you as believers, as Muslims, to feel the blessing and the beauty and the dynamics of the Ummah. So, before they enter uh, Jannah, there is al qanbara So they stop and they sit down. Why did you say that to me, man? You hurt my feelings and this. Uh, and then they say, oh, okay, I forgive you. And the other one says, I forgive you. Allah says, now you're welcome into Jannah. Because Allah said, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِيْلِ we took out with what's in their heart of hatred and like mm, holding grudges. They would become brothers facing one another. SubhanAllah, some of the ulama of tafsir said, why did Allah say facing one another? They said, because when someone sits next to you and you have to twist, your neck will hurt. So in Jannah there is no hurt. So Allah set them in front of you. No suffering, even on that small inconvenience. Mutaqabilin, facing one another. You are on your sarir, and and they are on their sarir. Subhanallah. Sarir and here means a place of sitting very comfortable. So, obviously, there is a place which is called Al-A'raf, in which the people who don't make it to Jannah, nor they make it to Jahannam. And they look at the people of Jahannam, and they say, Ya Allah, don't make us with them. They look at the people of Jannah, and they say, Ya Allah, make us with them. Eventually, at the end, Allah bestow His mercy upon them, but after a while because they did, they were not desires, they were on the edge in dunya, so they become on the edge in Akira, so don't be on the edge. This subject, life after death, that I have summarized in the world of Nasamat, the world of Ruh, Arwah, the world of Al-Arham, the world of dunya the world of Al-Barzakh, the world of Ayyum Al-Qiyamah, and then the world of Jannah, inshaAllah, Rabbil Alameen. Um, obviously, we have not spoke anything about Jannah and Jahannam, and we can, there's no time for that, but, um, but it, you know, that's the whole other thing. It's explained in the Quran in detail, so that you have no confusion about that. Um, we are in the middle of the road. And everything that comes ahead of you depends on what you do here. I'll leave you with something that has profoundly changed me. About 15 years ago, after learning and learning and learning and learning about life after death, and the grief and death and this and the judgment, I walked into a zone of fear that I like literally lost the appetite to eat, the sleep, this and this. And I, I got into, became sick and pale and lost so much weight. So, may Allah reward him, one of my teachers, mentors and, 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 and friends. Um, he came and said, what, what's wrong? He came and visited from Chicago. I was here in Fresno, California. And then he said, um, what's wrong with you? I said, no, I'm, I'm just so scared. I just don't know. Like I, every time I think of the details and I actualize the experience, it's just scary. It's very scary. And he looked at me and he said, that's good. That's good fruit of Iman that you are actualizing and being scared. Now this is scared. You need to turn it into energy. Because I'm not scared of any of this. I said, what are you talking about, Sheikh? He said, I'm not scared of any of this. I said, what are you scared of? He said, I'm scared of dunya. I said, how? Explain. He said, uh, does Allah change his word? I said, no. Does his prophet say something not true? I said, no. Allah said in the Quran, he speaks only the truth. He said, if Allah says something and promises something and says something, would he do it or not? He said, he said uh, if you do a good job in dunya, didn't Allah promise you a peaceful death? I said, yes, he did. Didn't Allah promise you an amazing, beautiful grave? I said, yes, he did. Didn't Allah promise you to be from the Aminin and Aminun, the one who's secure on the Day of Judgment. I said, yes, he did. Didn't Allah promise you Jannah? 
I said, yes, he did. I said, and he said, and all of this is dependent on what? And that's when it hit me. I cried and cried and cried and cried nonstop for oh God knows how long because I realize the scariest thing is in our blind spot. This dunya, whatever you do here, everything else depends on it. If you do a good job here, Allah doesn't change his word. He will not, oh, trick you. Oh, you did good and then your grave will be a bad place. He will not do that. So what's the most scary thing is what you do here and your choices here. Because based on these choices, your grave, your death experience, your grave, your resurrection, 50,000 years of waiting, judgment, <coughs> passing over the Sirat, going to Jannah, it's all dependent on what you do here. And here, sometimes we just get lazy, stressed, stingy, coward. And that's why the most beautiful dua, one of the most, and they're all beautiful, but one of the most relevant, amazing, powerful, needed, 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 needed dua is when the Prophet said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal hazan وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْعَجْزِ وَالْكَسَلِ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْجُبْنِ وَالْبُخْرِ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ غَلَبَةِ الدَّيْنِ وَقَهْرِ الرِّجَالِ Ya Allah, I seek refuge with you from helplessness and laziness. Two items. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ I seek refuge in you from stress and depression. And I seek refuge in you from cowardness and stinginess. And I seek refuge with you from the plots of men, the plots of people against me, and from the burden of debt. Mm -hmm. <coughs> These eight items represent like what holds us back. Laziness, helplessness, stress, depression, cowardness, stinginess. I mean, before all of this, do we even have an interest? Are we interested? Like, are you interested? Or are you not? Like, you really want to be interested. This is you on the line, not someone else. So, I want to end with that. I want to say, may Allah have mercy on all of my brothers and sisters who are buried in five pillars and in every other cemetery. I mean, including my father, your father, and anyone who is buried there of our relatives. Of relatives, inshallah. May Allah make us live a life of khidna and service and worship. May Allah inspire us to learn the right knowledge. May Allah inspire us to make the right choices on the right knowledge. May Allah inspire us to want to know and discover the Quran and the Sunnah of His Prophet. May Allah make it interesting for us and interest us in making a deep transformation from inside out, Ya Rabbi. May Allah enlighten us, may Allah help us, have mercy on us, forgive us, and guide us in every decision that we make, Ya Rabbi. May Allah make our life a life of work, and a life of service, and a life of meaning that has meaning and purpose, Ya Rabbi. May Allah make us die a death of peace. May Allah is make our graves part of Jannah, Ya Rabbi, one of the gardens of Jannah, Ya Allah. May Allah make our resurrection an easy resurrection. May Allah secure us from the fear of that day. May Allah make us and resurrect us with the prophets and messengers and martyrs and righteous, Ya Rabbi. May Allah Put us under the shadow of his throne where Amen. there is no shadow but the shadow of his throne. Amen. May Allah make us drink from the hand of the Prophet a Amen. cup that we never feel thirsty after it. Ya Allah, may Allah make us from Ahlul Iman, from Ahlul Nur on the Day of Judgment. Amen. That we have light. May Allah make us pass over the Sirat quickly and get to Jannah. Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah make our Shafi on the Day of Judgment our dear and beloved Muhammad sallallahu May Allah make us honorable in his eyes. May Allah make us want to seek 
being honorable in his eyes. May Allah make us seek him and love him and want him and desire him, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah make us want to know and follow and walk in the footsteps of his dear and beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah make us from his sunnah, from Ahlul Sunnah, from his people who want to follow his footsteps, from Jama'at al Muslimin, from those who worked for the sake of Allah, Ya Allah, and from those whom Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. May Allah make us from those who are honorable, from Al Muttaqeen, and make Allah make us at the end from those who are winners, Al Fa'izun, and from Al Muflihun, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma ameen. May Allah send his ultimate peace and blessing upon his dear and beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanah wa fi al-akhirati hasanah wa qina adab al-nar. Allahumma arina al-haq haqqan wa arzuqna attiba'ah wa arina al-batila batilan wa arzuqna ishtinaabah. Allahumma سهل علينا موتنا ونور علينا قبورنا وآمنا يوم الفزع الأكبر اللهم يا رب العالمين اجعلنا من أهل الجنة ولا تجعلنا من أهل النار يا رب العالمين اللهم يا ربنا آتنا ورحمنا وعافنا وعف عنا يا أكرم الأكرمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله صلى الله عليه وسلم